call the meeting to order. So uh, let's go ahead and open the meeting. There we go. Um, Fran Inman, Chair of the California Transportation Commission, and delighted to be here today. Um, I am going to speak on behalf of all of our commissioners. We take our role of serving the entire state of California very, very seriously. And these town hall meetings, in addition to our 10 other hearings of the year, give us a great opportunity to really get out and to go to our different regions and uh, meet with our folks and hear from our communities. And so that's, we've been touring this morning and look forward to hearing from all of you right now. So with that, Vice Chair Kneinenberg, do you want to add anything? You've done a great job, Chair Inman, so I'm going to, let's get started. All right, Chris Howard, do you want to give us a welcome to the region? Or whatever kind of re welcome you want to give. All right, we're on. Welcome again to beautiful Delnar County where the redwoods meet the sea. Thank you for spending so much time with us today and really getting a chance to see what Delnar County is all about, which is our natural beauty. It's what draws visitors from not only the United States, but from all over the world to take into account what we have to offer, which is the beautiful Pacific Ocean and our redwoods. But it also, with those natural wonders, also comes the position of being landlocked and I think you as transportation commissioners as staff really got a chance to experience what transportation was all about just to get to our neck of the woods last night um, we we're fortunate to have Mary Enscore with you who helped convey your departure which should have been from our local airport which we still hope you get a chance to see before you leave here but from Medford Oregon unfortunately where your flight was diverted to Crescent City it's a great airport, but it's not our airport. We wish you could have seen that, but you made it here. Yeah. Oh, bathroom's in the lobby, so even better. <laughs> okay. So transportation is the way goods and people get to and from our beautiful community. And without it, we're dead in the water. And you heard many stories on our trips today across Last Chance Grade, up 199, 197, and back down 101 about the partnerships that we've had to create, not only with the Transportation Commission like we did in LA, where you guys were gracious enough to approve the $50 million to advance our environmental and geotechnical work on Last Chance Grade, but also the various other projects that we have in play right now to ensure the continued resiliency, the capacity and growth that we need so our children here could survive. The stories you're gonna to hear today from folks sitting here in the audience that are not only citizens, business owners, but also representatives from the various agencies and nonprofits will reflect on what we need to do to grow here in our community. We have people from our Office of Emergency Services. We have people from all three of our county governments. We have people representing four federally recognized tribes here in our audience today to share with you about the uniqueness of Delnar County and those unique issues related to transportation. We hope that we're able to impart to you the importance of our small little neck of the woods, that population just below 28,000, that needs a voice at your level to make sure those cogs in this wheel to get us forward are working. I welcome you again and look forward to hearing your response after the meeting today. Thank you very much, Chris, thank you. Okay, now we're gonna start our presentations. Do we have Congressman Huffman? He's not here yet. Okay, so we'll skip over that and we'll move on to Caltrans. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the coast. I like to say true Northern California. I hear some people say Northern California, different parts of the state. No, this is true Northern California. So uh, my name is Richard Mullen, Deputy Director for Caltrans. Um, just want to thank everybody. It's nice to see you in a town hall setting, especially up here, com as compared to being at one of the other meetings we frequent. Um, just want to mention that uh, uh, you know, we're, we're dedicated to uh, a transportation system, sustainable system for the economy, um, livable economy. 
And through that process, it requires smart decisions that are balanced among stakeholders. Earlier today on the tour, you got a little glimpse of the various issues that we face up here with very, various permitting agencies. And so we're anxious to share these upcoming projects. I know we have four of them and there may be some Q and A. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to hear those projects. And I believe first off will be Jamie Mattioli. Good afternoon, Jamie Mattioli. I'm the project manager for Last Chance Grade. Thanks for your support and funding $50 million for Last Chance Grade so that we could get through the environmental phase of the project. I'm gonna talk about the, the results that we have and the results we need in the future to deliver the project. And first I need to talk about the context of the project. So this is where we were today. We talked about these four major landslides. I think everybody here understands the context. This area has been moving for decades. It's been expensive to maintain and to repair, and it's been a burden on the traveling public as, we, as we've had to go through delay after delay. Um, you were standing here this morning. This is the area at the farther northern end of the grade, and that steel pole next to the people talking there in 2016 was up at the top of the road. Um, we've spent 85 million uh, since the late 80s repairing the job and 56 million just since 2010. So the, the costs of repairing and maintaining the facility are accelerating. And it's, um, this, is, this map shows everything. If there's a failure at last chance grade, there's a six hour detour. If you're living in Klamath and you're a member of Yurok tribe and you're sending your children to school in Crescent City, it's likely an eight hour detour. So there's no way to get to school. Um, so there's all these critical needs um, for the facility that wouldn't be met if there was a closure and high, high cost uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the region in terms of economic impacts. So we all agree that there's a need for a project. We have these three major hurdles to get over to really deliver the project. And we're focused right now on the, on the first hurdle, the environmental document, which has just been funded. We can't uh, get to design until we get over that hurdle. We can't get to construction until we get over that hurdle. And to get over the environmental document, we really need to, before we do anything else, perform these preliminary geotechnical studies. They're really the key first step, and that's what we've been doing and we'll talk about that. There are a number of risks to delivering the project. The three major risks are litigation. We've seen projects with much smaller scope be held up in court to the north of us and to the south of us. Richardson's Grove and Del Norte STAA are held up in court right now. And really the magnitude of scope compared to this project is very small. Um, there's a lot we need to learn about the project still. So there's a risk of late discoveries that change our thinking about the alternatives on the, on the project that would require us to revise the scope. And if we're already in the middle of environmental studies, that means we have to go back, perform multiple years of environmental studies. So what we're doing to mi minimize that risk is we're casting a wider footprint for our environmental studies as we learn about the geology. The other major risk is mitigation deadlock. At some point, the key stakeholders need to come together and agree on what we can do to mitigate for the impacts we're going to have. And we have a lot, a large number of stakeholders, uh, many of them with unique objectives, potentially conflicting objectives. So getting everybody to agree is a major obstacle. And we're mitigating that risk by starting early with the public engagement, having these conversations early and often. And I'll talk about the different um, engagement efforts. Major unknowns, the geology. This map uh, goes back to 2000 when we mapped the landslides in the area. Those pink blobs are mapped landslides. North is up. We knew that where we had the current alignment, there's instability issues. We also knew that to the east, there's mapped landslides. So we don't, we don't know still 
if we put a new road there and we spend hundreds of millions of dollars, if we end up with the same sort of problems you witnessed this morning. So we have to understand the geology on the east side of the, of the alignment before we can establish those footprints and know we're looking in the right place. This is one of the most environmentally sensitive areas you could propose a new highway. We're in state parks, national parks. It's a, it's a coastal, we're in the coastal zone. It's a world heritage site. Five tribes claim ancestral territory in the area. So we need to understand what are the sensitivities and um, what are the potential impacts. When we're building this thing, we're gonna have to follow permit requirements. And that could tell us our work window is two months or three months or five months or six months. We don't know. So that dictates how fast we can get through construction. So these are the challenges that we have that we need to understand before we could firmly establish the scope, the cost, and the schedule of the project. This is an aerial view of the project. And really one of the largest unknowns we, we still have is which alternative we will ultimately select. And we will select that at the end of the environmental process. We have a range of alternatives right now that bypass us around the west side. We have two alternatives that exist on the west side, and we have a tunnel that goes under the slide. There's one prediction I like to make about the alternatives. We don't have it yet. I don't think we have a grasp of the ultimate alternative that we will build. And um, we will be revising the alternatives as we learn more about the environment and the geology. The first task we have for our consultant team when they come on board is develop a framework for selecting that alternative. What do we need to do to make those key decisions? How do we get the criteria agreed upon by our stakeholders so that we can make those key decisions? This is the schedule. And we've heard from the public, we've heard from the commission, we've heard from my father-in-law that this schedule is not something that people support or um, Best think, pay the most attention to your father. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, um, a couple of things about the schedule. This is what we made when we started out in 2016 when we had the planning document. It was based on the worst case. It was based on alternatives that we've since eliminated. So one, we think we can accelerate it. And two, we're working on a plan to accelerate it. And we expect to come back to the public with, with that plan in spring 2020 or summer 2020. Um, yeah, that's enough about that. The current funding situation, we have $50 million programmed for the environmental studies that gets us all the way through the environmental phase of the project. We'll have preliminary engineering, geotech, and an environmental document at the end of that. We, design remains unfunded. Right-of-way, which includes mitigation dollars, also remains unfunded. And construction could range be, between $300 million to $1 billion based on the alternative we ultimately select. To deliver a project, we need the right people. So we're taking a number of innovative approaches to get the right people. One, we're using a project-specific contract. It's the largest project-specific contract Caltrans has ever done for a project like this. We've done a few in District 7. So this is really an innovative approach. It brings together all the functions into one group, and the contract will live with the life of the environmental phase. So environmental, geotech, engineering, project management, it's all in one group and they live with the life of the job. And we're making good progress. We expect to have that uh, contract executed by December, in December, sorry. Um, we have a fully assigned Caltrans staff with loads of experience, over hundreds of years of experience just within the Caltrans team of delivering highway projects. We're having partners perform studies. I, I saw Victor from State Parks. State Parks is performing uh, Martin and Fisher studies for this project. So we're uh, leveraging the best experts, the local experts, to do the work. CMGC stands for Gen Construction Manager General Contractor. Just think of it as a contractor. And the contractor will come sit on our team. They'll advise us on the best means and methods to build the project. And they'll just give us a better understanding of how we're going to get this thing built. And that helps us relay our understanding um, to our partners and to the public. <coughs> This is a photo of folks from a number of stakeholder groups. We met up at the, uh, one of the proposed alternatives on the east side of the project back in August, and we had folks from these four stakeholder groups, and, I, and many of us feel the public engagement work is the most important thing we're doing to minimize risk 
and to streamline delivery of the project. So I'm just going to quickly cover the four groups here and, and what they do. Congressman Huffman's group includes a cross-section of members of the public. We have people in business, tribal governments, local governments, um, citizen groups, Caltrans, I mentioned parks, uh, landowners, all working together to advise Caltrans on the uh, alternative selection process and other things. Biological Working Group, we're bringing together all the permitting agencies, and they're looking at the biology, they're looking at what studies we do, and we meet regularly with them. So that's the folks that will be permitting the job. The partner group includes the land managers, so the parks and the tribes and Green Diamond Resources who own the, the property we're on here. We all meet together and work out land management issues. And the cultural resources working group includes the five tribes, Caltrans, and parks. And we are sorting out how we proceed with tribal consultation throughout the life of the job and we're working on a programmatic agreement, which is a proactive approach to establishing how we all work together for the rest of the job. We need to use innovative processes to deliver this uh, on time and on schedule and ahead of schedule. Um, and that'll save time and reduce risk. So I'll talk about some of the innovative processes we're doing throughout project development. Uh, one of the first things we've done is eliminated those three C alternatives. So in the upper right, that red area, um, is the area of those three alternatives that we've eliminated because they're too costly. We determined they're too high risk geotechnically and the environmental impacts are too high. So all of the stakeholders came together and said, no, let's eliminate those. That reduces the footprint by 900 acres. It saves us millions of dollars, a lot of time. So now we're focused in that green area for all of the alternatives. We're doing a number of things to accelerate the environmental phase of the project. Um, mainly, we're taking things that we often do in series, one after the other, and we're putting them together. For example, the preliminary geotechnical studies, you could argue typically we would do those first. We'd have all the information done, we'd have the wells in, we'd monitor them for years, then we go ahead and establish the footprints of the project. We are beginning the environmental studies as we are finishing the geotechnical studies. So we're not waiting until we're completely done. Alternative procurement, I mentioned CMGC. Um, I mentioned this project-specific contract. We're making full use of preliminary design. Often we only design to a certain amount so that we can get the environmental document. We're gonna take, make full use of our ability to design in the environmental phase. I mentioned the cultural programmatic agreement establishes the processes, reduces risk, and um, concurrent and accelerated internal reviews. Often we hand our document to legal or headquarters environmental, then they hand it to legal. I said, no, this is last chance grade. They've agreed to look at those at the same time, saving months. In the design phase, I already mentioned we're, we're doing a lot of the work up front. Uh, we will have uh, the design established as best we can so that right after we're done that, with that first hurdle, we're passing off the permit applications. So we're not, typically you get done with the environmental document, you design to a certain level, and then you can hand in your permits. We want to hand in those permits as soon as we can, which will save time. Early development of mitigation plans. As I mentioned, we need to get everybody to agree on how we're going to mitigate for the project. And again, CMGC, having the contractor on board, increases our understanding, reduces risk. And for the construction phase, the same thing. Having that contractor, they've bought in to the design, they've bought into the quantities, uh, the construction methods, it reduces risk, reduces the chance that they find something. We have to go back and uh, take more time. The, the current results that we have, uh, most important ones are that we've conducted our phase one and phase two preliminary geotech. We split this into three phases because some of these um, investigations could be done on existing roads. They were really easy to get to environmentally. Some were more challenging and some we need to drop in equipment using helicopters within the old growth forest where there are no roads. That requires an environmental document. It's a project in itself, and it's uh, been a major challenge. And thanks to our, our partnerships with parks and others, we're on track to complete phase three uh, next year. But we already have data from phase one. Phase two is halfway done. That data from phase one has allowed us to redraw that map we showed with the pink blobs. They're moving. So there's areas where we thought there were landslides. They're not landslides. The area in the melange on the southern uh, part of the grade that we drove over that was rolling, it's deeper than we thought. 
uh, because we, we've drilled it. So that tells us that three alternatives that go through that area, we really need to evaluate very carefully uh, what's going on there. So we already have data from the preliminary geotech that's shaping the alternatives. And we have the confidence now that we're looking in the right place. So as we begin those environmental studies, there's, we're reducing the risk that we have to go back and study in a new area. We've eliminated the three C alternatives. We're on track for phase three geotech because of uh, the good work of our partners at state parks and others. Our next steps are full environmental studies of over a thousand acres beginning in 2020, a number of studies, for biology, general, cultural, and we're continuing with the preliminary geotech 2020. Uh, we should, we're on track to wrap up the last phase of the preliminary geotechnical studies. So again, really the lessons learned is successful engagement is reducing the risks, it's streamlining uh, project delivery. And again, thank you um, commissioners for your support of the project. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, Commissioner Van Kleinenberg. Thank you. Um, so as I understand it, uh, you were able to bring together uh, uh, everyone who is, has an interest in the project and agree on the project need. Yes. And, and everyone agreed on a project document that agreed to the need, correct? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have something similar on a uh, going forward on a framework on how they will, everyone will work together uh, going forward? A after we've agreed on the need, we have a framework on how we're going to work together um, cooperatively to make decisions going forward. Do you have something like that? Not yet, but that's one of the first things I'm asking the consultant to do is have this alternative selection process dialed in. Okay. And that, uh, that's the framework we use to select the alternative. Okay. Yes. Second of all, um, when we were in, uh, when we approved the, the money for the environmental, uh, one of the concerns I had was, um, having a more specific timeline mm -hmm. uh, rather than larger dates, having, you know, um, intermediary timeline goals and things like that. Yes. Yeah. And then a, a, a corresponding decision tree on how we're going to make decisions and what decisions need to be made to, move, to go to the next step. Yeah. How, where are you at in developing those things? Because I had hoped to see mm -hmm. something like that at this town hall. We do have a more uh, detailed schedule. I didn't prepare anything to bring it okay. today. And that's another thing we're asking the consultant to look at. They're okay. delivering the whole job. They're the experts in how to deliver it. We're going to ask them, how do you deliver this as efficiently as, as you can? And that's when we'll come back to the public and say, in spring or summer, we, we have an update to the schedule. These are the steps we need to get through. Can you consider if you, yeah. you, you know, um, uh, maybe in the June time period, coming back to the commission with yes. a brief presentation that would say, okay, here is our specific timeline. And here's our specific decision, decision tree model. Absolutely, yes. That, that would be something I would look for. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have an appreciation that this is um, one of the largest um, uh, shop projects that we could have in the near term future and one with the most risks. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we want to take a, a little bit more time to, to have regular updates through the process. Yes. And obviously it's one that has a lot of uh, community interest. Um, you know, uh, it, one of the things that we talked about at lunch was we had a very similar complicated project in San Diego County and we used a legislative model to bring everyone together and, and push for a decision. And when we've toured, that now has been completed. When we've toured that, everyone has, uh, it was the resource agencies that were very excited to show us the project because everybody worked together. Um, you, you, you mentioned the issues yeah. of, you know, competing uh, work windows, mm -hmm. where one agency says, well, I want, want this to be a work window, another agency, and, and getting everyone working together. Um, have you thought, do we need to do any type of a legislative action to try to mm -hmm. pull this together, or are you still at the point where you feel like you can do this without that, that tool? It hasn't crossed my mind, honestly. Um, the stakeholders have been working really well together. We have, we think the right people at the table, they're joining us on a regular basis and we're collaborative. Um, but if I did see a need, um, I, we would express that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, and just one more, you know, 
having a construction date of 2039 mm -hmm. um, is still a, a great concern. Yes. Um, I think we've all agreed upon the need, yes. and I think we, we agree, you know, uh, when what we saw today was we don't have as much time, we don't have that amount of time to get this done. And I think we also heard lots of, and saw lots of, um, uh, you know, this would be very dramatic to the community. Um, uh, I think everyone needs to pay close attention to the situation we had uh, on the Big Sur coast mm -hmm. where we lost a bridge two years ago. Um, fortunately, through some heroic efforts on, on, the PR, on the part of Caltrans, we were only out of commission for nine months. Mm -hmm. But the hardship that went for those nine months on those families that were cut off was significant and this would be much greater here. So I think um, I would urge, uh, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the, the sense of urgency that we need to have in, in moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm first gonna apologize to our team. Director Branson is here with us and Deputy Director Mitch Weiss and I should have introduced those initially, so my apology and the rest of our uh, CTC staff, can you all stand up, wave your hands, uh, just so everybody knows. This was our uh, challenge to get here team last night, but, but we made it, so, so we, uh, we appreciate it. I have a couple of quick questions for you. You mentioned that uh, litigation was the first thing you mentioned under your major risk, and hopefully by bringing folks together and by everybody agreeing that doing nothing is not an option, we can uh, minimize that. But late discoveries and scope change was number two, and you referred to the consultant doing this, how do we make sure that the consultant isn't gone and then we're all still sitting here with a uh, back asking for mm -hmm. more funding because there were some late discoveries. So how are we protecting ourselves to make sure that we all collectively own the success of this? Mm. If I understand the question, how, uh, if the consultant um, leaves? Is that the question? Well, the yeah. question is, it, it sounded like the consultant's doing this, the consultant's right, right, doing right. this, but okay. we it's important that all I, own I this success. So I don't think I stressed enough that Caltrans remains oversight of the project. Caltrans is the owner. Caltrans uh, retains responsibility for the key engagement. Um, Caltrans has a dedicated oversight team with the, that hundreds of years of experience that are uh, leading the project. And the consultant, um, very capable, qualified, best qualified consultant, will take on the brunt of the delivery work, the project management, the um, environmental, et cetera. Um, so it, it's really no different uh, for, for Caltrans in taking ownership of that work as far as comparing to any other project in the district. Okay, yeah. well, we would all, I mean, a $50 million vote is a big vote. Yes. and. So to not have a finite timeline, as Commissioner Van Kenneenberg me mentioned, typically is one indicator for us that we're liable to have folks back saying, whoops, we, we need some more money mm -hmm. to finish this up. So I think for all of us, um, every dollar is precious yes. in the state of California and our federal dollars as well, mm -hmm. and our partners. So I think we all have to just keep our noses uh, to work and make sure that that we get all the resource folks. I mean, I am sitting here thinking, why didn't we bring Secretary Crowfoot with us today? Uh, I would have loved to have Wade. We will be talking to him again on Thursday about the work of the 1282 task force was really around just this. This was a law that was actually sponsored by the commission to ask our partners, bring all your partners in, everybody agree, sit at the table, do the work that needs to be done, and let's let's move forward uh, together. And then also in the state, we have advanced mitigation and looking at how can we have better environmental outcomes from really, instead of piecemealing thing, making some big, big um, splashes, so to speak, in terms of getting things done. So this is a huge project, and you know, when you're a six hour workaround, 
it's a resiliency and you know it's not an option i mean six hours is not a workaround that that means we simply can't do what we were doing so um Hopefully, you'll be back early and say we're ready to go to the next phase. So with that, are there any other questions? Our staff have any questions? Are we good? Yeah, oh, Director Branson. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, I saw mm -hmm. on the slide that um, it was for the design work is where you're submitting for the permit approvals. But in PAED and in environmental, you'll be working alongside the permit agencies, right? So you'll have a pretty good idea if you're going to more uh, full scope design mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. environmental, yeah. by the time environmental is done, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, will you have fairly, will you have a high level of competency that the permit mm -hmm. agencies are on board with whatever you move forward to in design so that we minimize any rework? That's my question. That's the plan. Okay, yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Yes, I just want to. So I'd like to have, uh, if if staff can note, um, I'd like to m make sure that we hear timeline and decision tree and those things, and uh, so maybe if we can schedule them for either June or August to give us an update, I would appreciate that. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. So now we're going to move back to item. Uh, Number one under presentations, yeah. Congressman Huffman, do you want to okay. come on down? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, commissioners, and and also your your great staff. Uh, the first thing I want to say is the representative of this community in Washington is thank you, uh, thank you for the financial support that has taken us this far into the environmental review process uh, thank you for the additional commitment to this project that we see from the fact that you're here on the ground with your team and, and i was out there in that precarious stretch of roadway with you earlier today i hope and i could actually tell from some of our conversations even right there that you're taking away from this visit um, the extreme sense of urgency that this community has felt for many years and so commissioner when you say uh, I want to see this move faster. I want to see this move with a sense of urgency. Uh, you're singing our song. Uh, and I really am grateful for that, as well as the financial support that has taken us this far. I just want to make a couple of points, and I'll be brief. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have of me. But um, you, you understand the need for this project. And I think you understand it a little more today than you may have even previously. Um, but I want you to also understand how much this community uh, is ready for your additional support and, and will make good on it. Uh, the hard work that we have done now for well over two years in bringing every stakeholder that could possibly have an interest in this project together uh, in, in moving forward so that the expectations are set so that we avoid the litigation scenario uh, that has been mentioned. You can never absolutely guarantee that you won't have litigation at the end of a project like this, but we're doing all the right things to make sure that we don't. And I know that at every level of government, certainly, uh, you know that my colleagues, uh, Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Wood are here on this trip, and we are shoulder to shoulder uh, in every respect to make sure that all of the agencies at every level of government are working together as a team and that this entire community uh, is at the table working together to avoid the types of misunderstandings and conflicts that could lead to litigation. We know that we just don't have time for that. Uh, this project is too urgent. And the good news that I have seen so far in this stakeholder process uh, that we've put together is that I think everybody around the table gets it. I really do. And so I know you're thinking carefully about the public dollars that you steward and the tough decisions that you have to make. Uh, I, I just want to tell you with a very high level of confidence that this is a community that is unified, that is functioning together at a high level, and that shares your desire to move this project forward expeditiously uh, because we don't have any options. Uh, and I hope that, too, is one of the takeaways uh, from your visit today. So thank you again very much. Just know that uh, as the federal representative uh, for this community, I, I understand that this is going to have to be a team effort. 
uh, that it will uh, require additional federal support. I am committed 100 percent to making sure that happens uh, and also just continuing to be grateful and appreciative of the great state support we've seen from all of you so far. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the congressman? No, I would I, just, I, oh, I would go just, ahead. I would just thank you for, for working to bring the, the shalom, the peace to the, <laughs> to the process. I know, I know that it takes a lot of patience and I, I just want to, uh, I know that you've worked very hard so far and, and I know you're going to continue to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Also, I wanted to mention, it's probably been at least a year ago, but we had Alex Herzog out here, who I think his new office is in OMB or something, but he is to be like an ombudsman for all the dashboard projects in DC, and I, I would hope that this could be considered a dashboard project because of it being a main lifeline, in my opinion, uh, for these communities. So. Uh, I would encourage us to make sure that we engage uh, Alex on that. I'm not sure how many projects he's actually been able to shepherd through, but any help we can get in terms of uh, getting all our federal partners yeah. to have a project on a dashboard. So at least, you know, to Commissioner Van Kenmeinerberg's suggestion is, you know, give us a timeline and we'll put our chart up and make sure that we measure our success. So that, w that would be great if we could do that. I think uh, if you want to call it good news, uh, I, I'm not sure it's good news, but uh, everywhere I go uh, in the federal transportation uh, hierarchy, people are familiar with last chance grade. Uh, this is a really unique and compelling project. And uh, at the legislative level, my colleague, uh, the chair of our transportation committee, Peter DeFazio, is my immediate neighbor to the north. Uh, we've had him down here. We've had him in a helicopter. We've had him on the ground at the places you saw today. He understands very much that this is a lifeline project for this community and that it actually would have ripple effects well up into his district uh, if and when a failure occurs. So I think we've, we've got uh, certainly the, the situational awareness in all the right places, and I think we've got the basis support uh, to really build the federal part uh, of making this project a, a success. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I do see we have Senator McGuire back there. Are you gonna lean in now? No? Okay, we're good? Okay, glad you joined us anyway, so it's perfect. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the uh, one US 199 safety project. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is David Morgan. I'm the traffic safety chief for District 1. Del Norte is one of the four counties that I can uh, operate in. I operate in Lake Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte. Um, I've got various safety projects on 199 that I'm addressing collisions where people went into the river. Uh, those projects are progressing nicely. I've got short other projects around post mile 24 where I have other people having collisions and I'm addressing those appropriately as well. Um, what we do have, I've worked out a solution with Tamara and the local transportation commission to do a risk uh, route s safety analysis. And I've got about 75% of those logistics in place. I should have a contractor on board and working on the route safety concept or analysis by early January. That's got to be done by an outside consultant, so I can't do it myself. So uh, that is scheduled for the near fu future. Um, traffic safety in general, if I may speak on that, is the highest concept or highest priority for Caltrans. We're here about making sure everybody gets home safely every day. It's constantly what I'm telling my staff, so I have both short, long, uh, medium, and long-term uh, solutions as people have collisions, and you guys probably don't hear much about my short-term or medium-term solutions because they could involve me directing you know, my staff of 700 or 400, I think we about 400 in maintenance, to actually install temporary measures to make sure that collisions don't happen in the short-term future or short-term period while I'm implementing what you do see, which is some of my long-term projects, installing guardrail, doing shoulder widening, doing road widening, um, those types of things. The people in Del Norte, I've continually worked with the local transportation commission with trying to make sure that we 
get a win-win. So Tamara and I frequently communicate about what are the goals of Del Norte County, and then I then take my projects and try to figure out a way to make sure that I can implement some of her features as well within, of course, the guidelines of the budgets that I'm directed to use. Um, is there any specific questions you have for me on 199? Yes, Commissioner Van can I have it? So uh, what are your goals? On 199? Yeah. Uh, the goals of traffic safety are to reduce fatalities to zero across the state. Yeah. And to do that, it's very hard to do because we all have a fixed checkbook. Right. Um, so I am fighting that battle on, on multiple fronts. As I said, I have short, long, intermediate, and long-term plans. So a, a longer-term plan is the, re the road safety audit, which is scheduled to be implemented in January via one of my contractors. And like I said, I've got about 75% of those logistics in place to make that happen. Uh, any, the problem with that is most 199, the collisions are spread across the entire route. And so it's very hard to me, for me to make arguments of concentrations, but where I can make arg arguments of concentrations, I definitely go after the money through the Highway Safety Improvement Program. So the, fa the fabulous thing about Del Norte County is that everyone wants to come visit Del Norte County. The, the, mm -hmm. the, um, having come and visited you in the past, um, you uh, were, you're, uh, you're not, people who are from outside the area are not familiar. Uh, they're distracted by the beauty and they're on very narrow roads. Um, correct. And it, there's not a lot of places to, you were like, oh, I want to stop and look at that. And there's not a lot of places to do that along the 199 corridor as much as I think tourists want to do that. Absolutely. How are you dealing with the, that issue? Um, I'm proceeding forward at this point. You know, there are several locations, not in Del Norte County, but in other counties where I've been going to the same curves for the last 15 to 20 years. And I'm really quite disgusted with that because I've been doing these incremental changes for years, you know, put up chevrons and then more chevrons and then flashing beacons and bigger flashing beacons. And I've been there so much that, you know, I can think I can prove to traffic safety and headquarters that I've been putting in incremental improvements until I'm like blue in the face and now it's the time to face the music and now we're going to do a curve improvement and now we're going to do widening if we have to do and so after I establish to be a good steward of the taxpayers dollars at that point if I keep going back to the same curves I'm going to put my foot down and start putting my fists up keep fighting the man um. <laughs> says the man <laughs> um, it's not us lady yeah um, so how are you working in coordination um, because there are a few um, closer to be closer to um, Crescent City there are a few um, uh, uh, areas of, of natural uh, state park uh, where there's not an easy way for traffic to get, traffic coming in and on on to 199. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a way that everyone's coordinating with state parks and and with uh, local agencies to improve those areas so that we can make sure that people are safely uh, exiting the road and coming on the road in those areas? We're continually looking at those areas where there's interchanges and obviously conflict points that we hope to reduce in the future. Some of the incremental improvements we're doing is, you know, we're taking the signs and making sure the signs get shifted over the lanes. We get more markings on the road. We make it clearer for the drivers and or put bicyclists to know where they should be at any one time. So we're doing those incremental changes, trying to make it wider. One thing that you had mentioned is, you know, there's a lot of places where I can't do anything. Well, that's kind of true and kind of not true because, because I could, for instance, in the tree area, you know, I could narrow the lanes to, let's say, 11-foot lane, is depending on whether I can keep the off-tracking of a truck within a lane and give a bicycle a little bit more room. So uh, the safety job that I have at 0G130, one, one, uh, which is at Del Norte 10 and a half that Tamara and I have talked uh, for, for about for quite some time, 
you know, bes besides building a $25 million viaduct for 300, 300 feet, you know, what I am doing there is I'm grabbing anything I can grab from those shoulders, including two or three feet or four feet, before I put in the guardrail and make sure no one else goes in the river and dies. So I'm grabbing every inch I can out there uh, as I see opportunity to do so. You're welcome. Director Ransom, no. So help me out a little bit because we've run into the safety uh, audit or safety analysis. Sure, the road safety other, audit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So explain that process a little bit as opposed to what you would typically do because if you're the safety officer, it seems to me like that's what you do anyway. So It is, us. and actually I'm fairly good at it. In the state, I'm very good at it, as a matter of fact. But uh, what a road safety audit is, is this is an independent group, usually a contractor, that would go out there and maybe perhaps talk to me about collecting the collisions, perhaps collect collisions themselves using what's called switters, which is what CHP enters their collisions into. And so it's, it's basically a, a new set of eyes looking at collision data specifically going okay is there something that can be done to you know make this collision not happen again which which again that's what i do all day is i look at collisions and go okay what can be done to make sure that no one else gets hurt here and, and then depending on what happened in the collisions um, the safety audit which, audit which would be you know an independent person would come up with you know with the group uh, recommendations as to what should or shouldn't be done. And depending on what they say, and if, if they include me, which I assume they will, uh, is that you know I will look at before they actually make the recommendations as to whether the safety improvement program can support that dollars wise. So before they you know recommend a curve improvement where I have only one collision, it's going to be very hard for me to make an argument that I should spend you know six million dollars on a curve improvement. If they come up with and say, well, if we group the collisions like this, it's because you can group them like this and you can change your time frequency. And when you're looking at collisions, depending on how they're grouped is how you can make an argument as to what improvement you can and cannot do. But bottom line, it's an independent audit by someone other than the traffic safety office, which normally does you know, collision analysis and safety improvements. It's a fresh set of eyes. Okay. Yes, Director Branson. I, I do have a question for you now. Um, sure. Okay, so the safety audit, is that something that Caltrans is paying for? And is that in part, is there a disagreement with Del Norte County and Caltrans on safety improvements? I, I just it will be part of, of the safety program, which is we're funded at 90% by the federal people. Mm -hmm. And so I've already had discussions with the headquarters traffic safety about, you know, allotting 3,000 hours towards my group, it will be paid 90, 10% Fed state money. So I will, this is an approved activity by the federal agencies. Okay. okay. So, okay. and so CHP is a part of that safety audit or? I would assume so, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And does- It'd be a very good idea to have them aboard. <laughs> right. Does Del Norte County um, participate in that at all? Do they? Um, I don't know without coming okay. to I mean, the specifics of it yet. Yeah. Uh, I would assume Tamara. so. I would assume that yeah. I would be talking to Tamara and that okay. we would hopefully bring in Del Norte, Caltrans, uh, you know, CHP. Okay. Some but of the you other. would be leading that effort? Or no, is this would be the, yeah, this, no, it wouldn't it. be headquarters. It would be an independent contractor. Yeah, but I guess what I'm asking is you hire the contractor. That's correct. Whose agreement is it? And as part of that contract, can you specify a level of participation? Right. They will okay. basically be the facilitator. So they'll gather the data, gather the groups, run the PDTs. Okay. And then we come up with a recommendation based on, you know, everything that we see and what we can and cannot. Because you got to get everybody to play. So get everybody to play and participate. And they usually can have a much better product. Okay. And your timeline? A January of okay. 2020 is when we'll bring them on board. So I would hope we could finish it by, by the end of the year. You're welcome. Well, but if we have 90, 10 opportunities, and I don't know where the congressman went. Is he hiding here somewhere or did he sneak out? He, okay. But I mean, to me, if we can work and learn and be better from a 90 to 10 investment, we ought to, yeah. you know, we can ask 
uh, part of this learning experience for us being out was we always learn something new as well. So to the extent, uh, and safety is our number one concern too. For anybody in transportation, it has to be or you shouldn't be in transportation, in my opinion. So I think for all of us, maybe this is because the worst call we get is when we learn that there's been one more accident and there's one more cross that's going to be on the side of the road. So anything we can do and if we handcuff ourselves by all the rules and regs and stuff we all uh, have layered on over the years. I think, you know, we probably should put this on an agenda item and talk about this in a little more depth because this is not the first uh, safety analysis that's come to us. And, yeah. you know, we've had our, our um, regional partners asking for it and, you know, not mm -hmm. to make it anybody pointing fingers at anybody, but safety is what we all want. So let's see what we can what we can do. I that. would agree. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Dr. Fine Bridge. That just sounds... <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm here to present two bridge projects, both of which will have uh, items before uh, the CTC in December. And both of these projects have uh, been around for quite some time but I believe we're at a good uh, position now to deliver these projects. By the way, my name is David Melendrez. I'm a project manager here in Eureka, relatively new to project management, almost three years. Prior to that, I was in the field of environmental engineering for about 27 years. Uh, <clears throat> when I first became a project manager, they said, don't worry, we're not gonna give you Dr. Fine project. But I really enjoy this project because it has all the elements to make it very challenging. Uh, the project is located just south of 197, where it comes into 101. Uh, the Dr. Dr. Ernest Fine Memorial Bridge was built in 1940. It has two 12-foot lanes, one-foot non-standard shoulders, and two 21-inch sidewalks. There's a picture looking north and a picture looking south. Need for the project, there's a steel degradation occurring, the fracture critical during a seismic event. It is also scour critical at the piers. It is functionally obsolete, if you will, and we need to bring it up to current design and seismic standards. The current, oh, this, is the, this, this, this is out of order. I apologize, but it's here now. This is the current status of the project. We had a meeting uh, with the resource agencies on September 17th. We presented our uh, project to them, and uh, it's been a long, uh, a long way to get to where we are now. Uh, the, we, the, the resource agencies now fully support our project and are committed to communicating with us. We've had several meetings, several all-day meetings to discuss this project so that Caltrans can address their concerns. Currently, oh, we had a public open house on October 16th. Most of the surrounding property owners attended. They all expressed support for the on-alignment alternative. And the most common, the biggest comment I heard there is it's time to replace this bridge. We have a draft EIR that was released for uh, public comment on October 1st, and PNED is scheduled for 3 to 2020. Uh, we'll, st we'll skip this one, skip that one. Okay, so you heard about the, uh, this area being uh, rich in resources. The Smith River is the, uh, the only undammed perennial river in the state of California. It has the longest reach. There are no structures to impede its flow, its flow or fish migration. We have uh, lots of endangered and threatened species. We have uh, the, the uh, let's see, western yellow-billed cuckoo. We have uh, the uh, long, fin, long fin smelt. We have the bald eagle. We have Chinook. We have salmon. We have uh, yellow-legged frogs. We have the Pacific Ushalon, is what they call it, the long finch smelt. There's also been sightings of the Pacific Harbor seal and sea lion at this bridge site location. If you see on the left here are the list of all the agencies that we need to coordinate with to deliver this project. And again, there's a lot of uh, environmental resources here. We, uh, in 2017, we scheduled two all-day meetings with the resource agencies to discuss this project. Uh, the, the two biggest issues was access, and the other one was whether or not we're going to have an off or on alignment uh, alternative. 
The evaluation, the, in 2017, we, we circulated an initial study, uh, mitigated neg deck, which evaluated two, well, evaluated two project alternatives. One is a cast in place box girder bridge on the existing alignment. The proposal was to jack and slide the existing bridge to be, function as a detour, and the other alternative was the no build. Uh, that environmental document was circulated, and the main three concerns of the resource agencies was the temporary false work piles, potential impact to fisheries, and there is a freshwater pearl shell mussel species that inhabits the south bank of the river. The temporary false work piles, uh, they didn't, they, their, their concerns were debris racking as wood comes down the river, increased predation for fish, scour, and the duration. Because it is an undammed river, we have uh, coho salmon year round, and they wanted to see if we can construct this project in three seasons, three in channel seasons. So that was our goal. Uh, once, once we got these comment letters was, how can we overcome these challenges? So as I mentioned, the previous DED, we had temporary false work piles that would remain in the channel for one winter, and that was considered unacceptable. So we had to, we had to get around that. So Caltrans met with some private contractors to determine how can we build this superstructure in one season so we can eliminate the temporary false work piles. And they said, yeah, it can be done if you have two crews working 10 to 12 hour days. You also have to have a temporary gravel pad for access that has to be 100 feet wide so that two cranes can work at the same time. So we know that can be done. So we're proposing right now two 12-foot travel lanes, 8-foot shoulders, with a separate pedestrian walkway. Um, and our structural options are either cast in place or precast bridge. Uh, the alignment options are existing or downstream, and then the no-build alternative. All of these are evaluated in the environmental document. So we have three alternatives. The first alternative is cast in place bridge on a new downstream alignment. The second alternative is a precast bridge on a downstream alignment. Third is a cast in place bridge on the existing alignment. That was what was proposed in the 2017 draft environmental document, but we are informed by legal we have to carry that option forward as part of the EIR. So this is what it looks like. This is the alternative one, a cast in place on a westerly alignment. You can see it has a parabolic soffit. It, it has two piers in one location. This alternative would also require two viaducts as well as right away would have to be acquired. The second one is a precast uh, bridge where the superstructure elements are actually uh, built off site. They're brought on site and they're split to build this bridge. This bridge has uh, four piers in two locations. It also requires two viaducts and uh, right of way is also needed for this project. The third alternative is the cast in place box girder bridge on the current alignment. It has two piers in one location. There's no right of way needed, but we need to. Uh, figure out a detour bridge because there's a lot of risk with jacking and sliding an old bridge. So we looked at, can we construct a temporary bridge, a panel bridge, if you will? So we met with representatives from Acro Bridge to discuss the timing of this. How long would it take to build? How long would it take? Can we get it done in one season and start work right away? It eliminates the risk of jack and sliding an old bridge. It eliminates a traffic detour. The other I'll, the other ones will require a detour that would have to go along 197, 199 during the summer season, Jedediah State Parks. Just doesn't really, doesn't really sound like a good opportunity there. Um, and this is what it looks like. You can see we have a little diagram of the bridge structure with um, the temporary bridge to the right there. And that's, this is kind of the overall layout of the project. Um, sort of speaks for itself. And the last one we had to get over was this uh, freshwater pearl shell mussel. It uh, inhabits the south bank. Here's kind of what it looks like right on the south bank. How are we going to build this bridge without impacting that species? And the way we're going to do it is build a trestle across it and eliminate the contractor from being able to work in that area. So we have a mussel report by the Xerxes Society that's part of the EIR. Uh, it recommends relocating the mussels prior to construction. The relocation has to occur during low flow. 
So in order to accomplish that, we're going to have to relocate these muscles a year prior to construction because we're trying to keep it within three in-water construction seasons. More, uh, lots of mitigation here. We've got to salvage, relocate the muscles. We've got to protect the muscle bed. We've got to monitor and remove debris. We have uh, off-site stream restoration for uh, the fisheries. And there is also planned improvements at Dominique Creek in the Smith River watershed as a fish passage project. Yes. Like I said, this was actually, this one has too many slides. I, I reduced it considerably, so I'm almost done actually. So we have an opportunity for public comment. Um, you can mail any comments to Caltrans directly or email Rochelle Hadley. And the environmental document is also available at the library here. And uh, any questions or comments? That was pretty Questions? Quick. I guess okay. we do. The Thank next you. project is Oops, can we, there we go. The next project is a Hunter and Panther Creek Bridges replacement project. This project is located just north of the town of Klamath. And this is an aerial view of it. They're relatively close together. This is the existing Panther Creek Bridge. This is gonna be the new bridge. It's a tied steel arch bridge. And what, you'll, what, what is unique about this project is it will have no piers in the, in the creek, in Panther Creek. And this is what it looks like, a simulation, when we complete it. The next bridge is the Hunter Creek Bridge. This bridge is a typical uh, box girder bridge. It will have piles in the creek bed. This is a simulation of what it looks like when it will be completed. And this, this, this project took a lot of effort on Caltrans' part. There's a lot of environmental requirements. It is located on the Yurok Reservation, so it took a lot of communication and meetings with them. And part of the tied steel arch is that no work at all can occur in Panther Creek. Uh, there can be no pile driving in Panther Creek, which elim eliminates half with construction. The tied steel arch bridge is the first of its kind built by Caltrans. It also requires a temporary bridge for through traffic, similar to what we're proposing for Dr. Fine. And another important part of this is that the ordinary high water elevation at Panther Creek does not fluctuate at all, maybe, maybe a foot. So there is no low flow. There's, it's always full, and, and that creates also some challenges for us. This project was originally scheduled to RTL in 2019. Given the challenges of this sensitive environment during the the uh, environmental process, we had to move PANED out a year. That constrained our uh, design phase. It also locked in our uh, capital construction costs in accordance with SB1. Late in the design phase, we, we saw items that were not fully accounted for at the project report phase. So we had to add these items in. That resulted in a total of greater than 120% of the programmed amount. Uh, the district tried to get those costs below 120%, but we thought that that introduced too many risks and that they may come back to bite us during construction. Uh, the final estimate is 124% above the programmed budget. We have obtained all the necessary permits and all the mitigation for this project has already been fulfilled. And we will be requesting allocation for this project at the December CTC. Any questions? Questions? Mitch? Yes, do you mean 124% over the programmed budget or 124% of the programmed budget? 120% of the programmed amount. Wasn't that difficult. <laughs> but yeah. Any additional questions? I think we're good. All right. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Okay. Um, we are going to start our briefs and we will start with the city of Crescent City, please. All right. Thank you, uh, commissioners, for uh, for coming up and making the uh, the long travel. You heard from from uh, Caltrans, uh, all of the uh, the good work that they're doing to get you to uh, to our community and to the city of Crescent City. And uh, unfortunately, I'd like to say that's where our transportation commission 
uh, challenges stop, but, uh, but that is not the case. Uh, there, are, uh, there are several uh, uh, challenges, uh, but we do like to view them as opportunities. So I'd like to highlight a couple of projects. Uh, the first is a success project, and that is our Sunset Circle uh, pedestrian trail project. Sunset Circle is the uh, connection. So this is a, a shot of, of Highway 101 uh, right before you get to the s curves as you come into town. So the harbor is located just to the right of the screen. You can see a nice new uh, pedestrian trail that was put in just a couple of years ago that outlets actually on the highway. This is part of the California Coastal Trail. The actual, the Coastal Trail actually runs along Sunset Circle and then connects you into the, uh, to the Howe Drive area with a nice pedestrian parking lot and a trailhead. Uh, this is what Sunset Circle looks like today. You can see that there really isn't much of a pedestrian trail and you're forced to walk along the street. City put in through the uh, help of the local transportation commission an ATP grant application. We received uh, $800,000 to put in this class one trail uh, and it is definitely viewed as a success. This was from start to finish. So all the way through PAED, the uh, right of way acquisition. And I just saw the plans come across my desk today and they'll go before our city council for approval here in the next couple of weeks and we'll be under construction hopefully this spring. Uh, so that's, a, that's, the, uh, that's the success story and I'll try to keep my briefs uh, fairly short as there's a lot of presenters behind me and a lot to talk about. So 1300 lineal feet class one trail funded uh, by ATP and RSTP funds which is critical to our community. Uh, the next one I'd like to talk about is Front Street. So we had the opportunity to drive down Front Street. Front Street is uh, definitely a unique experience. Um, that's exactly what we want people to, to, uh, to have when they come here is that experience. Unfortunately, this experience isn't exactly the one that we want people to remember. There's a lot of structural needs and the, the roadway really doesn't fit the, uh, the sense of context that we want for our community. So you can see we have a beautiful beachfront park here right by the, uh, right by the harbor itself. Uh, there's access to the, to the beach and then it's really that spine between the downtown and, uh, and that beachfront park and all of the amenities. Uh, the, uh, the front street itself uh, wasn't always this way. So this is a, a shot back in the uh, early 1900s uh, where front street and the seawall and the beachfront park wasn't there. So the actual tides actually came up to front street, but front street itself has been a critical uh, component of this community, you know, since the, uh, since the settlement. This is the new plan. So this, is, this has been a vision for this community and a project for decades. Uh, in 2011, 2012, we came up with this overall theme, and that's to really, really have that, that, that person, either local residents or that visitor come in and experience what it is to be here. And that's where the redwoods meet the sea. And so not only is this a street project, and it's a little hard to see on here, but it, it takes the five lane road and reduce it down to, to a two lane vehicular uh, path of travel, and then separates out through a median, a, a separate pedestrian parking area. And then the vision here is to have where the redwoods meet the sea, go start from the highway with the upland, have the artwork represent the redwoods and the, the, the tribal history that we have here, and then culminate down at the, at the deep sea with artwork that might represent the breaching whales. And so it really is that experience uh, that we want the community to have. So this is a shot of what it might look like uh, from the highway with an archway saying Crescent City where the redwoods meet the sea. Here's a shot with the boardwalk stamp sidewalks. You can see that the two lane road, uh, which really reduces a safety hazard as well. Right now it's over 80 feet in width. So this will reduce that crossing of that vehicular pathway down to about 36. And then you have your pedestrian uh, parking area and, uh, and use area for uh, that adjacent area to the park. So how do we get this done? This is a $20 million project. It has significant structural issues to the street, so it's not just an overlay and building some curbs and gutters. Well, we get it done through partnerships, we get it done through creative thinking, and we get it done through relentless effort. And that's gonna be with the, uh, with the commission's help, it's with our local transportation commission, uh, federal funding, as well as community partners. So the relentless effort, here's everything that we've done since the project first developed. So you can see multiple ATP applications in which we weren't quite successful uh, with those. We were successful with some CDBG funding to try to build some of the underlayment, uh, the uh, critical pieces of storm drain uh, sewer that will reduce the, uh, the project amount. And then we have uh, partnered with the uh, Elk Valley Rancheria here locally and submitted a, uh, actually submitted a build grant application for, uh, for federal funding for this project. It was denied last year, but we have an application in this year and are still, uh, still hopeful on that. 
Uh, so the CWG portion will actually uh, will build half of Front Street. So that's the part that, that will, be, uh, will be under construction, hopefully this spring. Uh, again, that's going to go out to bed here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that's not the, the end all get all on it. We still need to have that build uh, grant portion, which is about $15 million worth. So Pebble Beach Drive. We also have the opportunity to take the commission on tour of Pebble Beach Drive. Iconic street. Uh, right along the, the, the beautiful coastline that we have here in Crescent City really accentuates uh, what it means to be on the California coast. California Coastal Trail runs right along that area. Uh, you can see this is, a, this is a beautiful shot of it. However, this project also doesn't have those pedestrian facilities that we really want to have to make it a safe place to go, to make that experience that we want people to have. It also has some significant problems in regard to erosion. And so you can see here's some shots of an erosion event that happened in December of 2016. Significant storms damaged, battered the coastline. Significant erosion happened in the city and in the county. Uh, you can see here some other, some other shots of this. Fortunately, through this, there was some disaster relief funds made available to both the city and the county. The city has about $5 million that were that was made available through this project to be able to, to stabilize this bank and have this, this project come to life and be stabilized so that we can have those pedestrian facilities that we have imagined and we do have that, that master plan for. Unfortunately, with, uh, with ER projects, with emergency relief projects, there's a short time frame. Yeah, two years from the time the disaster hits to the time you have to be under construction. And so that is a very short time frame. You heard from Caltrans, you heard what it takes, and you know what it takes to put a project like this together. It's the environmental, it's the permitting, it's the design, it's all the geotechnical. All that has to be reduced into two years from the time that disaster struck you when you were kind of set back and dealing with all that to the time the project's actually under construction. 76 time extension applications were submitted last year. 66 were denied. That's 87%. So right now we have our time extension in, but for the city of Crescent City with the resources we have, and I'm sure Delnor County is gonna to speak to this as well, this is our opportunity to try to, to try to recover from a disaster like this, to try to put the infrastructure in place so it doesn't happen again, so we can have streets like this and we can have a beautiful California coastal trail with the pedestrian improvements. Those are the, those are the main projects that we have. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Van Kenan. So what, it, um, I guess on the CR, and uh, what agencies are, are, are being, are specifically being too slow in their response to get, to get you on, who was, who was slow in this process to, to get it, you approved? Well, as far as the, the approval, we were approved for the funds. I know. I'm sorry, in the environmental. Who, you, you were hung up on, on... So, so we were hung up in environmental. And part of it is just the, the, the process to get even to that environmental. So it's, it's procuring the consultants. It's completing the geotechnical. Because we have to be actually in, under construction. So we have to have the design done, the geotechnical done, and the environmental all done within two years. And that just wasn't, that just wasn't possible. Uh, so we're dealing with the California uh, Coastal Commission on this and acquiring those permits. Uh, so it's really just that time frame of two years is just too short to complete those tasks. And I think that's what, you know, it's not only the city of Crescent City or the county. I mean, you had 76 other agencies that submitted time extensions for projects like this. And you just can't get it done in that, in that time frame. And then, you know, if you don't meet the time frame, then you're not eligible for any of the money. Does, do, so, do they understand... Um, the dilemma that they the, the, do they understand that you know under certain circumstances that two years just may not be enough we have certainly tried to articulate that and in, and in the uh, in the time uh, in the time request that we've submitted as well as the the obstacles and they even list that you know shortage of staff is not is not a reason uh, other disasters that you might have encountered that is not a reason for a time extension permitting all those things are not eligible reasons what, for what can extension. what do you perceive the commission can do to be of assistance in that any way that we can extend that time frame out just a more realistic time frame so it's not a two-year period it's more like say a four or five year period to be able to get through each of these different phases and you know i think that i think the reason behind it is they want to make sure that these projects are proceeding uh in a very expeditious manner and so Maybe an option is to put a time frame on each of the different components that it takes so that you can make sure that the project is proceeding, but that you don't have to complete all of those phases 
and get to construction within two years. So maybe it's, you know, get through the, the PAED within a certain amount of time and get through the design within a certain amount of time. That might be an option. Director Branson, is there any time that we've commented on this or waiting on this? Yeah, I guess um, I want to ask you who, if, which federal agency is giving you the time frame? I'm not familiar with this. So, so the, and Tamara can probably speak to it. Is it FEMA? It, is this a FEMA? It's through Federal Highways. It is, oh, is Federal Highway through Administration. Federal Highways is, is the ultimate funding agency, but, okay. but through Caltrans Local Assistant, the Disaster Relief Program is who, uh, is who administers that project. Okay, so we will, as staff, circle back with um, uh, Caltrans Local Assistance as well as our, our um, partners at Federal Highway Administration and look into that. I think the other question that I would have is if they're if there's a need for within state, um, our state process is beyond Caltrans, but permit agencies, and we don't want to see a loss of federal funding um, to anywhere in the state uh, that is entitled to federal funding. So that would be something that maybe um, we can have Commission Staff circle with you and get a little more information that would and be see great. how we can help. Because both the city's can. project and the county's project, which yeah. just extends into the county, is funded 87% approximately through yeah. federal highways. With just so this maybe my question thing. is, who is who is the actual agency denying your request for the extension? Is it federal highways? I believe it goes through federal highways. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We can ask on that, I think. Um, before you leave, I have a question on Front Street. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're going to take it from a five lane to a two lane. Yes. And you also called it Tsunami Way. And to me, safety is always first and foremost. We have suffered through wildfires yeah. where there was concern over a road diet that perhaps caused some challenges. How are we confident that we have met all of our safety requirements. When did we build the five lanes and think that we needed five? Was that when we had different industry or? It, it, was, it was different industry. It was when you had your, your only regional hospital that was located at the end. You also had the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had actually set up a concrete batch plant where they were building the tetrapod and dolos to, uh, to armor the, uh, the breakwater. That was actually done in what's now known as Beachfront Park. Uh, you had a lot of the, there was actually three different piers that, uh, that extended into the harbor. And so the community has just changed. And so that's, that's when they originally built the seawall, I believe was in 1929. Uh, so it was just after that, that picture that I showed of the, the historic uh, uh, high tide coming in. And then at that point, the street was just expanded to, to that width. As in regard to tsunamis, you can see the slides actually, this was a, this was a thought years ago of of a possible you know rebranding of, of front street this is not coming to fruition so tsunami way does not exist it is front street the actual evacuation route is it would not be down front street it would be to the north it would be to head up towards ninth street towards high ground part of the front street application is to is to try to address just that it's to uh, put in some markings on the pavements to make sure that people understand the, uh, the tsunami uh, danger that they are in in a low area like that, and more importantly, where to go. And you know, they, there's the emergency of preparedness piece, which is know your zone. And so we want to utilize this to educate people that they are in this zone and exactly what to do. So we're looking at possibly even PA systems as well. So we can, we, there would be an announcement, and this is, this is an idea that actually came from the city's sister city, Rikuzen Takeda, Japan, uh, which obviously suffered that devastating tsunami. These are some of the things that they're putting in. We want to try to learn from that and uh, incorporate that in the design. So uh, I think on the bus ride today, you mentioned that this soccer area, park area, gets mm -hmm. lots of activity with virtually no parking. When, when you put that in, what were we assuming? What assumptions were made? When we put the, the oh, park, the, I mean, it, it seems to me that in the planning process, whenever we have a development, we look up on how people are going to get there and what the demands would be. So in Crescent City has a lot of lot of history. So the park was built in the 60s. 
Okay. Uh, and so this was through a state lands grant and has evolved over time. And so these soccer leagues have evolved. And so the demand is the demand is there. People utilize it. It's a great amenity to to our community. And so now we just need to take advantage of some of the opportunities where we can we can make sure we have that infrastructure to support it. And then in terms of economic development, do you have your business community supporting your vision of a road diet and everybody's going to be happy? We're not going to have the businesses coming forward and saying, you've killed my business? Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of public outreach okay. uh, when the project was first envisioned. And then as we go through these grants, we continue to reach out uh, to these businesses. Uh, there is there's a lot of community support. There's a lot of feeling if we can create this environment where it's that experience that really accentuates that sense of context that we have here with the redwoods and the national park and the ocean and the whales, this will bring people and, and it will really accentuate their business. So there's, there's full support and a lot of excitement. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll do one more and then we'll take a quick break, but let's do the County of Del Norte. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Heidi Kunstel and I am the director of the county's community development department of which um, public works is a part of the department. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to overview several of the challenges and successes that the County of Dole Norte has experienced relative to transportation. Um, the first would be the active transportation program. In calendar year um, or application year 2015, uh, we applied for a active transportation grant for um, the Best Maxwell School area which um, we had previously applied the year before, but we were unsuccessful. Um, taking some of the feedback that we were given as part of the 2014 application, we tried to um, draw on that and to make improvements. However, again, we were um, unsuccessful. Uh, we feel that this was a, a very um, appropriate location for ATP uh, funds due to the setting. Uh, it's located in an area with multiple schools as well as located in an urban residential area. Uh, we had a chance to kind of visit that today on the, the bus ride. Um, I'd kind of like to provide a brief overview of the project and why we felt it was a good, uh-oh, sorry. We had it the first, did we have the first one? Good. Okay, well. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, back on track. Okay. So first I wanted to go over the project limits. The project is located on El Dorado Street, which runs from Pacific Avenue to Del Norte High School. And then a secondary portion is on West Harding Avenue, which runs from El Dorado to uh, the city limits. Uh, the project included uh, curbs, gutters, sidewalk, for three blocks, it also included new signage, an overlay, and striping. Um, excuse me for just a second. Um, there were five K through eight schools within the project area. And if you look out a little bit further within that one mile area, we also have other um, higher education schools, um, Family Resource Center, and um, College of the Redwoods, or Del Norte High School, excuse me. Um, Sorry. Uh, here is a picture of the project before, and this is a project of the um, project afterward. Um, ultimately, we were able to fund the project through um, a combination of community development block grant funds and RSTP funds. We received $1 million in CDBG public improvement funds, and then the remaining for the RSTP for the construction of the sidewalk on West Harding Avenue. Okay, moving on to the emergency relief program, uh, City Manager Weir uh, pretty much explained the issues that we have with this particular program and the constraints that we have as far as being able to get to complete a project within that window of time. Um, we just like to add to it that the county supports um, the efforts of um, CSAC, SEAC, and NACO in order to um, extend the, um, the statutory 
limit from the Federal Highways Administration from two to six years in order to um, complete these projects with the um, possibility of also um, having extensions of time. So, uh, Moving on to our successes, uh, the Highway Bridge Program. This is um, going to show you several of our bridges. The first is the Hurdy Gurdy Bridge Replacement Bridge at Big Flat Road. The bridge initially had a sufficiency rating of 48.3 in 2015. The bridge replacement was funded with about 88.5% Highway Bridge Program funds and 11.5% of uh, toll credits. Without the toll credits, the county and the region could not have afforded the over one half million dollar uh, grant match for that. This is a photograph of the bridge today and as you can see um, the bridge is uh, available for resource extraction and other um, recreational uses uh, within the Six Rivers National Forest. Our second bridge is the South Fork Smith River Bridge Replacement Project on South Fork Road which was funded with 88.5% of the Highway Bridge Program funds, as well as 11.5% of the Forest Highway programs, um, Program funds. Excuse me. Uh, again, without the match money, we would never have been able to complete this project. In this case, for this particular bridge, it was over $1 million. This is a photograph of the bridge today. Um, the funding of bridge projects at 100% is critical. A designated match for on-system and off-system bridge projects needs to be established. Toll credit should be kept for on-system bridges as well as, excuse me, off-system bridges as well as extended to on-system. Without a funding source to match the highway bridge program, the county and the region would not have access to highway bridge program funds. Lastly, we have our local streets and road program projects, which are funded through the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, also known as um, SB1. In calendar year 2017-2018, uh, the County Board of Supervisors approved a list of projects for chip seals in the Fortick area. Uh, the, the roads that are listed in green have been completed, uh, orange are in progress, and blue have not begun. Um, we have completed, as you'll see, um, quite a few of them. Uh, counts for over 10 miles. Uh, in calendar year 2018-2019, uh, the Board of Supervisors approved another list of trip sills, primarily in the Smith River area. Most of these are in progress, and we estimate them to be completed in spring 2020, as well as bringing forward two of the roads that were on the prior list, um, South Bank Road and Moorhead Road also in the spring of 2020. Uh, also in fiscal year um, 2018 and 2019, we added some overlays uh, in the combination of the uh, Crescent City urban area and in the um, Fort Dick area. Uh, the majority of these have been completed. Uh, those that are on hold, we're just waiting um, in order to do some accessible curb ramps before doing the overlays. Of. Also, we've done some other small maintenance, including grind outs on Lake Earl Road, a culvert replacement on Alder Road, and then also we plan to do some curb road, some curb improvements um, in the Arlington Drive in West Madison area near Mary Peacock School. And finally, for fiscal year uh, 1920, we have a slate of projects, including uh, 5.24 miles of chip seals. Uh, six miles of preparatory work for future um, years, uh, six tenths of a mile of an overlay on Alder Road, which we completed uh, during the summer, and then 12 curb ramps. Uh, while this seems like a lot of work for us still complete, we are genuinely grateful to be in the, this position to have these projects to complete. Um, without this funding source, um, many, if not all, of these projects that I've listed would never have happened or wouldn't happen in a timely manner, and our local roads would have continued to deteriorate. So um, we are very appreciative of um, this program. Uh, we'd also like to point out the, um, the great work that we've had with your office, with the local, local streets and roads program, uh, staff in the intake of our project list and all the monitoring that goes along with it. They've provided um, numerous valuable 
uh, webinars to us uh, when we have questions by phone or email, extremely responsive, and for that we're very thankful. So thank you. If you have any questions, uh, I have uh, my staff here to help. Yes, Director Branson. I just wanted to um, take the opportunity to um, assure you that we're, um, with our active transportation program at the commission, uh, over the last, um, since inception really, of that program, we're receiving hundreds and hundreds of applications and only able to fund a third of those mm -hmm. applications. And so as commission staff, we are posting our recommendations 20 days in advance of the commission taking action. action. The applications for those pro the projects we're recommending are online, and it would be a, a, a very good idea to take it take a look at the applications on how they're put together, you know, how they're, the projects are described. Um, the project that you, you showed us today, projects are, are very important projects. And I would just encourage you also to meet with our staff because I know that, um, you know, Lori Waters is here, our, our, um, our deputy for the active transportation program. And she is, um, very, very willing to go wherever she needs to go throughout the state. She is here. And um, just any questions that you have, we are embarking on, an, I know that you've received funding, but you have additional needs. And we're embarking on a new cycle of funding, and it would be good to just talk with her, um, you know, our team, about what makes a successful application to describe it, your project, in, in um, a way that we can better understand. because. Actually, we're out here now, but um, throughout the entire state of California, there's no way that our small team, Lori and um, her team, can go to every location. So it is, and it is dependent on what is put in that application mm -hmm. to describe the project. We, um, when the commission staff makes a recommendation to the commission, and we know we're only recommending a third of the projects that have been nominated, that means there's two thirds of the applications that came in of folks that are very discouraged that they didn't receive funding. So as staff, it's those projects that are really rising to the highest, highest level that we can put our recommendation on and know that we can defend our recommendation. But if you ever in the future see that you weren't successful from a commission staff um, recommendation, please call us, we can have a conversation um, that's that's our job. So our, we strive to be as open and transparent as we possibly can. So appreciated your presentation. Yeah, well, th thank you for all of that. And we, we do have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with Lori because we're not discouraged. We have an idea for another project, and we want to we want to talk to her about it. So Commissioner Van Kenneinberg, um, you mentioned the High Bridge Program. Do you have additional bridges that w could be ready to list in the next few years that that you haven't? A secured funding yet for? I'll leave that to our engineer. Okay. Um, we have bridges that will in the coming years need to be replaced. I have looked recently at the decision tree if you want to call it that and they're not something that would make the list at this point in time so we haven't filed or an application okay. but we are keeping an eye on it and seeing where we're falling relative to the state. I just I just would um, encourage you to um, continually con uh, as the new transportation bill f federally is coming together uh, I know that one of the concerns we're hearing throughout the state of California is that there's a numerous there's a numerous bridges that are at the end of their lifespan in the state and so um, a lot of bridge engineers are saying hey we need more money in the highway bridge program so as if you want to communicate that to Congressman Huffman as well as other people, I would encourage you to do that because I, I do believe we're hearing the same s story of br many of our bridges were put in the 20s and 30s and they're, they're getting to the end of their lifespans and we need more money in that pool rather than less. Definitely. I have just a quick question. Can we walk up mem or back up memory lane of SB1? Okay. So um, is this the first one? Okay, so let's start there. So on this one, we had one Moorhead Road that hasn't started anything yet, and that's from 1718. So what's happening? 
I can tell you initially it was because once we completed the first uh, roads that are in green, we we hit the three hundred and thirty nine thousand or three hundred thirty four thousand so dollars that we had. Money. So we ran out of money, okay. and okay. It, it it's down to logistics and having our equipment in certain areas, and our road superintendent, our assistant road superintendent, um, have decided to tie it in with the slate of projects that we plan to do in the spring of 2020. We also have, um, well, but if you really want to get- 18 to 2020, I mean, we're, we're working under asset management plan rules now, which tells all of us that hopefully we're working <laughs> strategically and targeted. So I, I'm I, a little concerned how something can be on this list as we picked it out, it was our first list to go and then I can, I can give you happened? a little more detail. Okay. Initially, we planned on doing it this summer. However, we had difficulty getting the chips that we need in order to do the chip sale, so we flip flop our projects. The overlays that we had planned for the spring of 2020, we did during the summer of 2019. And in the meantime, we have sourced another source of rocks, but we've had to buy several pieces of equipment that needed to happen in fiscal year. 1920 budget in order to be able to go and get the rock that we need in order to do the chip seals. So had we not had that hiccup, that road would have been done this summer. Okay, and South Bank Road is we underway? Did, we, yes, we've done approximately one mile of it. It's about three miles long, and that will also be done in spring 2020. So we did that in 1718, and then we're coming back three years later? Because we have a very short window of time, yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, it's not, we actually, in 1718, the only work we actually did was preparatory work. The actual work that we, to complete it, Okay. for example, when we did the reporting the first fiscal year, it was only, say, $34,000. Okay. And the okay. remaining work okay. was done. So. Okay, so then move me to the next year, if we can. Okay, so this year causes me concern because part of the responsibility of the SB1 gives us at the commission uh, more accountability, responsibility. Mm -hmm. So when I see a list of our report cards, so to speak, if, mm -hmm. if that's what we prepared here, and there's nothing green on it, and green meaning the, the we greens, finished. The right? greens are on the overlays. That's where I said we had a flip flop. These are the chip seals that were for the 1819 that should have been done during the summer had we had the, the chips available. So we didn't do any chip seals? No, we did not do any chip seals this summer because the source that we you had available was okay. very okay. poor. And we want the okay. longevity of the project right. product, okay. so to speak. Okay, and then take me to the next page. I was, uh, the colors were concerning me here, and I, yeah. I'm no, very I, I, visual, I, I, so I, I love it. colors, because that, but I would have expected yeah. to every year see some in each color, and then they yeah. moved up, and we kept them going. Mm -hmm. I think you misunderstood the, what the colors are. Overlays versus chip seals is, is, is No, I yeah. think it was status. Green is we finished it, yellow is we're working on it, and blue is we haven't started yeah. yet, right? Or did I misunderstand that? No, 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 that? You're, you're, you're right. Um, however, w for example, all those that were in orange, the chip sales, just so you know, there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into that. Yeah. And that work was during the summer because we were able to do that. So you so, were working on them. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay. 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 Well, as long as we can show to folks that we're making progress. So. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you get Thank my you. gist. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I've managed to get us behind schedule here. So let's pick up our pace a little bit. And now we're going to do Redwood Coast Transit Authority. Good, good afternoon. Let me be the 500th person to thank you guys for coming up here. This is a really great honor for the community. We're glad to have you. Um, my name is Joe Rye. I'm the general manager of Redwood Coast Transit. And I believe you met Chuck Clarkson earlier. He was your tour guide today. And uh, we're um, really pleased to be able to show you around to some of our projects. A uh, quick overview of what we are. You've been inside one of the vehicles. We have 13 total. 
and uh, eight of them are currently powered by gasoline and five diesels. Um, we use the, uh, currently we use the diesel on the inner city routes that go between here and Gasky and here in Arcata down in Humboldt County. Um, just because of the terrain, as you guys saw, it's pretty rugged, a lot of elevation change. Um, we use the gasoline vehicles around town here on the local stuff. And um, we are preparing for and planning for and hoping for electrification, especially of the local vehicles um, to comply with the Air Resources Board, of course. Um, but as you'll hear in a couple slides, there are issues with transit capital funding that are concerning there. Um, we have four local routes. They serve hourly headways Monday through Saturday. Uh, they're pretty productive. Uh, we have quite a transit riding population, especially around town here. We have two regional routes, one that starts at Smith River near the Oregon border and goes down as far as Arcata. That's Route 20, and that's a Greyhound interline route. So um, that's a route that at least some of the trips can be purchased through Greyhound and are advertised and ticketed uh, through Greyhound, or you can just pay cash like a normal bus route. And then the uh, Route 199 goes between Crescent City and Gasky to the east, heading towards Oregon, but it doesn't go that far. Um, we offer complimentary paratransit here in the Crescent City area, and then out in the, in the uh, countryside, we use flexing of the regional routes uh, upon advanced reservation for ADA eligible folks, up to three quarter mile off the main route. Um, our ridership peaked back in 2011, and, and then it's been on the decline for several years since until it rebounded last year. Um, one of the reasons of the rebound, we're really happy we forged a partnership through first through an LC top grant through the cap and trade funding. Thank you to the commission. Um, we, we're using that to fund a partnership with our local colleges, which is the College of the Redwoods, which I believe um, was mentioned earlier in, in Heidi's project, and then also with Humboldt State down in Arcata. So we have a, a number of students that ride down and back each day. Um, this. Uh, the next graph shows uh, what we just talked about. Our ridership um, is around 110,000 or so this last fiscal year. We just got the numbers in recently. So we bounced back about 10% after uh, a couple, three bad years of declining ridership. So this brings to the main point, because I know we want to catch up and everyone's running a little behind. Um, one of the main points I want you to take away with today is that um, the capital funding for rural transit providers, at least in California, but perhaps across the country, but in California, it's become a major problem. Um, as the graph shows, the uh, SB1 has been an incredible um, uh, supportive uh, thing for us and you see how it's in the last two years it's uh, more than doubled although our you know our numbers are modest they're population based and there's only 28,000 um, people here in Donart County but it really helped because the, the two uh, groups to the right are our federal funds 5311 and 5311 F is in Frank and those have both either been flat or dropped significantly over the last few years so it's really been sort of a wash We've, uh, SB1 came to the rescue, otherwise we would have had major service cuts. We did do a round of cuts uh, in, the, in 2017 that was a little bit painful, but um, we've been able to avoid further thanks to SB1. Um, this just goes through, I won't go through each one. In fact, I just touched on some of those, but our FTA funding, um, we use, uh, First, not FTA, let me, let me take a step back. Our, the money we use mostly for operating is our TDA, uh, LTF, local transportation funds, which is sales tax, and then our STA funds, which uh, SB1 bolstered by uh, more than doubled when SB1 kicked in in 2017. So we use those, to this, to date, we use those for operations, and it's allowed us to provide as much service as I walked you through a moment ago, a lot for a small rural county. Um, on the capital side, though, where the problems to get it is emerging is the federal commitment has dropped, and that's what we've been using to replace buses with all these years. So right now, um, with 5311F um, in, in the tank, we've uh, turned to 5339, which is a, a capital bus replacement fund, but it's, uh, it's competitive. Um, there's a national competitive that we've applied and, and swung and missed at a couple times, but we'll keep swinging. Um, the statewide one that probably comes before your desks, that one's been more kind to us. We got a couple buses two years ago and we're applying for a couple more, but it's not, on its own, it's not quite enough to, to, to maintain 
maintain our fleet. So we're also applying uh, for the first time, uh, we have an application in process for 5310 federal money for our dial ride fleet for our ADA paratransit. So if we're successful there, that will help. Um, one of our issues comes down to where does the local match come from in this, uh, in a way, it, it piggybacks on what Heidi was talking about on the road side. Uh, so Prop 1B played a huge role for us for the last 10 years or so. As you know, 2006 measure that, that brought a lot of transit capital money throughout the state. And luckily, my predecessor banked a lot of it. So we've been using that as a local match for over 10 years. But now it's dwindling down. We're down to our last about quarter million or so. So um, there's no... There doesn't seem to be any um, funding to replace it on the horizon. So that's the main message I want to, to convey to you is if you get a chance to talk to folks or during the next uh, federal reauthorization, it would be so great if more rural transit capital funding could be made available. Um, one other thing we're dealing with, I think this is a statewide issue or national issue, uh, labor costs for bus operations are going up and we're no exception here in Del Norte. So um, to comply, our, except ours is actually maybe a little bit more tied to the minimum wage increases that were enacted in the state. So um, our relate, that's uh, what you see here is our labor over the last seven years per hour of service. So it jumped up a lot two years ago and it's about to, I was going to put another bar in there for next year because our operations contract, I know what our costs are going to be. So it's going to jump like another three bucks an hour next year, which is fine. Um, it, we have other issues such as even compaction because now with the minimum wage rising, our operators that were a few bucks over that differential, they want to stay a few bucks over which, you know, I understand that. So it, it creates upward pressure on our cost structure. Um, this just talks a little about that. You can't get any leaner than we are, really. I'm part-time, and we're a virtual agency. We have no staff, so I'm a contractor. And, and the great Chuck that you met today, he's a contractor as well. So 85% um, of RCTA's budget is for our operations contract that pays for our drivers' supervision and dispatching. Uh, and maintenance, uh, about 10%, give or take, is fuel, and then about 6% is uh, the contract that I work under that has to manage the system. Um, being that lean, we don't have a lot of options, so if there's a downturn and our funding drops, we're really looking at service cuts. There's nowhere else to really cut the fat, uh, to really to, to make a, to a, um, mitigate revenue loss. Um, we have, on that note, we have built some reserve funds during the recent good years, so we're a little bit better prepared for a downturn than we were, say, three, four years ago. Um, this is a graphic of what we just talked about. It's most all of our expenses mostly all go to operations. Um, we've been doing some cool stuff in the last few years. We've modernized our fleet a lot, trying to keep up with what you see in the urban areas, what you might see at SAC RT back home. Um, we have a computerized dial ride software that we use to dispatch and schedule our paratransit uh, clients. Um, all our fleet has video surveillance, which is really helpful for safety and investigating incidents. Um, we, our newest toy is our AVL, our Automatic Vehicle Location CAD system, which uh, gathers a ton of data, which I just love because it's great for planning purposes. And it also provides a platform for pushing out real-time customer information. We have a phone app so you can see where your bus is at. Uh, and uh, speaking of phones, we also in the last year started um, selling tickets and passes on the phone through a, a partnership with Token Transit. So uh, some of these projects were done though because we have pretty much no capital money as I've whined about two or three times now. Some of these were done through our operations contracts. So in a way they caused some problems by raising operations costs, but we still need them. And it's really a reflection of we just don't have adequate capital funding to deal with the, the projects. Um, long term, we're just trying to, uh, uh, hoping that a uh, replacement for that Prop 1B PTMISEA uh, was the main source, the largest source of the Prop 1B funds that we use. We're hoping a, a, a replacement fund emerges. Um, at this point, it hasn't yet. Uh, SB1 has been helpful. Um, and we're basically, if operating costs continue to rise with our flat revenues, we'll probably have to trim the lesser productive service in order to use some of that operating money for capital and to, to meet the higher per unit costs for the operations. And uh, wrapping it up, we, uh, we provide a basic lifeline mobility. So our local service is pretty productive. I don't want to um, 
bore you guys with numbers, but we're probably in the 12 to 15 riders per hour locally, which is pretty good for a small town. But the regional stuff obviously isn't that high. So we're probably more around five riders an hour. So, you know, we'll continue to try to market and get that better, but it's a lifeline. That's folks' main transportation. So uh, it, 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 it serves an important role here in Del Norte. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that um, if you guys get a chance to spread the word about the rural transit capital, we'd really appreciate it. Any so questions? I have a question regarding the air resources rule 2030, I believe you have to be fully electric. Is that the deadline? And your plans do 2020? How are you going to get there? That's a good question. We're hoping that uh, somewhere along the line, the ARB um, and or maybe through the cap and trade funds that they, they identify and earmark a source for that to make up for the differential because we're looking at even in our yard, what kind of infrastructure investments exactly. are going to be necessary to get the charging stations in because that's a scary part. And then there's the differential per bus, which isn't as daunting, but it's the upfront deal to get the charging um, equipment infrastructure into our yard. We do own a yard here by the fairground, so we have the room have for the room. it. That's good. It's just a matter of uh, the money to pay for it. Goodness. Okay. We hear you. Uh, you mentioned your, your regional routes. What's your, in terms of miles, what's your longest route and what's the fare to ride that route? Uh, the, um, Good question. The longest route is Route 20, so it starts in at the Lucky 7 Casino in Smith River. It's just a few miles south of the Oregon border. Comes through Crescent City, then proceeds uh, uh, throughput to uh, Arcata in Humboldt County. So that's about, uh, I think it's about 90 miles, and it's uh, $10 for the longest zone. We implemented a zonal fare a few years ago. It used to be a flat fare of like $30 to go anywhere south of Klamath, so to try to make the the route more affordable to folks, it's a zonal base. So if you get it at like Klamath, for example, it's about six bucks, but if you catch it from Smith River, it's 10. Okay, any more questions? We're good. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So my agenda suggested a break, but I'm gonna make an executive decision and ask you all to take an independent break if you need one and just step out if you need to do that. But we're gonna keep working here because we really wanna hear from everybody. Also, I did wanna let the public know that if you wish to speak, um, public comments at the end, and there are speaker cards out there. If you will fill out a speaker card, uh, we will gather those and we'll know. So, yeah, okay. All right, so now we're going to go to the Del Norte Office of Emergency Services. Actually, I was given permission by the Del Norte Office of Emergency Services and Tamara Layton. I'm Charlie Helms, Harbor Master at, at uh, the Crescent City Harbor District. I got to meet most of you this morning. I just wanted to thank you all for being here and get across the point. You know, we're a small county and a small harbor, but we have over 100 commercial fishing boats moored in our harbor from families in town. And historically, more Dungeness crab is offloaded in Crescent City than any other port in California. There are some ups and downs, but we hold the number one spot. We have seven seafood buyers in our harbor, but only one processor. So millions of pounds of Dungeness crab has to leave our port in refrigerated trucks day after day after day. I know you all know how important this is, but it's really crucial to us because this is a big generator of revenue for our local families, and it really does have a multiplier effect throughout the community. So. Thank you all. Thank you for letting me, me take a quick shot up to say hi and thanks again for coming in and seeing how critical this is to us. Thank you. you. I appreciate that. You had me at Dungeness Crab. <laughs> Thank you. And if y'all haven't seen the exhibit on the wall, it's fascinating of all the various crabs there are. So there you go. Okay, now we're going to do emergency services. Perfect. That would be me. <laughs> Um, so hi, my name is Kimmy Scott. I'm the emergency services manager for the county of Del Norte. And uh, I want to thank the commission for being here <clears throat> and especially for taking the time to do some site touring today and really getting to know the lay of the land. So I don't have a PowerPoint for you. I, I just want to have a discussion uh, with you. And just uh, I'm going to repeat some of the things that my partners have already highlighted and I'd like to just elevate your awareness on a couple of other items. So the 2016 Del Norte County Regional 
<clears throat> transportation plan specifically calls out emergency preparedness in the action uh, element assumptions. And that it also mentions climate change. Uh, this is very important to me, and I'm glad that it is in there. Uh, our hazardous mitigation plan describes a number of hazards that threaten our communities and may force evacuations, uh, including dam failure, earthquakes, flooding, landslides, severe weather, tsunami, and wildfire. And uh, as you can imagine, most of these are augmented by the effects of climate change. So these hazards also have the uh, potential to affect evacuation routes. Um, our low-lying communities, such as Smith River, Fort Dick, Crescent City, and uh, Klamath are especially vulnerable to flooding and tsunamis. And some of our communities uh, up Highway 199, such as Hayuchi and Gasky and Big Flat, are especially vulnerable to wildfires, uh, which we've seen quite a, a lot of impact there over the last couple of years. Um, so maintaining a multi-model transportation network uh, is really important to us. So not only including roadways and bridges, but also foot and bike paths um, is really essential to those evacuation routes. Uh, I'm going to stray off my notes here for just a second and highlight uh, the harbor um, of special interest uh, to me for that. Uh, when we do our pedestrian evacuation models for tsunamis, uh, the harbor is sort of uh, the one place in our community that's especially vulnerable because there's no quick way out of there to some someplace safe. Um, so that's something that I definitely want to put high on your radar. And there's some ideas being considered on uh, how to help that, but they're going to be some big lifts. Um, so that's something that you'll probably hear more from us on later. Um, ongoing maintenance and operation of our airport uh, is really crucial to logistical support uh, of our community should a large-scale disaster happen. Um, as you can imagine, one of the things that keeps me awake at night is uh, our ability to be isolated. We're already pretty isolated even with good transportation routes, um, but uh, a large event, especially a large earthquake event, um, you know, you've heard we've had got bridges that are that are overdue. We've got potential for last chance grade north of the border, and I'll butcher the name of this, but the Huskabin slide that's uh, north of Brookings. Um, you know, in a large event, we're going to become isolated, and especially because we're so rural, we really rely on one another in this community. Uh, we have limited resources. Um, to share among us, and when those are further divided, it's even more e essential for us um, to, to be able to not have that, right? So this, this pre-planning and pre-work is really important. Um, if people are isolated, we've got the short-term issues of family reunification. You heard earlier, you know, it could take up to six hours to uh, work around last chance grade. And if we have that uh, at a period of time when people are at work and people are at school, we've got that immediate need to put families back together. And there's no immediate way to do that. There was some pre-planning done with all of our response partners um, around if a slide were to occur. And uh, you know we've got some things on paper, but there's no, there's no magic solution to this. You also have considerations, uh, emergency services. So, you know, fire and EMS, and uh, thankfully we do have some good partnerships with our friends to the south in Humboldt County, um, but uh, there's potential to be isolated from them as well, and uh, it's not timely to get folks up here. So, um, it's sort of islands is what, how I picture this in my mind, and that's scary for us. Uh, for all the, the scary parts, we have done a lot of good work here. You've heard um, a lot of good work that's been done already, a lot of good things that are in the works. On the emergency preparedness side, um, there's been a lot of community outreach done. I've been in this position since May, um, but I've worked with this office over the last several years that I've been in the community, and uh, there has been a lot of hard work done for community outreach. We've got one of the largest uh, community emergency response teams in all of California with people that have been through that training so that they can assist each other in an event. 
We have Connex boxes placed uh, throughout the county in sort of those island territories with some supplies in those, including medical supplies, should people become isolated. Um, and uh, mapping has been done. There's a new tsunami mapping that's going, uh, that's underway right now. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but there will be new maps coming out for Del Norte County shortly. Uh, we're looking at those having, uh, being ready for public distribution in March. There are many MOUs already in place, and we are working on putting more in place that assist with transportation for evacuation and reunification purposes. And uh, we've got great partnerships. So um, everybody you've heard from today and a lot of other people that you will hear from today uh, have regular meetings with OES. Uh, people participate heavily with each other um, when it comes to emergency services in this county. And I've worked in other counties where that's not the case. Um, tends to be an area where there's a lot of type A or double A personalities and people get siloed. That's not the case here. People here really work together and come together to get the job done. Um, pedestrian evacuation time analysis has been done. I, know I mentioned the advanced planning workshop for last chance grade. Um, something that's listening to everybody else that uh, I think is important to highlight um, to you folks especially is recovery planning. And so um, there was some of the discussion about Front Street and about Beachfront Park. And uh, you know, part of the reason that that is the way that it is is because we had a tsunami here in 1964. And people were in a hurry to put things back together because you have to get on with life. It's not just an uh, economical impact when this happens. It's a societal impact and it's an emotional impact and uh, we have to get back up and going. And so sometimes things aren't put back together the way that they should be. And so um, we're making it an effort to be proactive in that. Uh, we're all working more hours than we should with less staff than we should, right? And so it's hard to be forward thinking, but we're, we're trying to make an effort here for that to happen. So um, we're working with Humboldt County and Cal OES has uh, granted bringing recovery training to our region uh, early next year, and that'll be the first step. And so um, it is important for us that, you know, transportation is a lifeline. And so when that planning starts happening, um, making sure that the transportation lifeline is a key component of that recovery planning so that if and when bad things do happen, they do get put back together in a timely and efficient manner that's gonna be best for the long term and not just for the right now fix. And um, so with that, I don't know that I have a whole lot more for you, but I'm willing to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your good work. I don't think we have any questions. So. We're good. Right, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, next up we have the North State Super Region. Chair Inman, Commissioner Van Conenberg, Commission staff. Uh, Mike Woodman, Deputy Executive Director of the Nevada County Transportation Commission and Chair of the North State Super Region. Uh, for those in the audience that aren't familiar with the North State Super Region, the North State Super Region represents the 16 Northern California Regional Transportation Planning Agencies and Metropolitan Planning Organizations that work together with a unified voice to address state and federal transportation funding and policy and also to champion investments in the mega region, which includes Del Norte County. The North State Super Region met yesterday in Crescent City. Uh, some of the key topics that were discussed were the SB1, Solutions for Congested Corridors Guidelines, as well as the Cycle 5 Active Transportation Program Guidelines. I want to thank CTC staff for giving us the opportunity to provide focused comments uh, from the North State Super Region on those guidelines. Um, also provided for you a handout with an overview of the North State Super Region and some common challenges across the North State Super Region. Uh, I'm not going to cover those. I know you are familiar with them, but I thought it might be informative for the new uh, commissioners on the CTC. Um, and with that, I just want to thank the CTC on behalf of the North State Super Region for hosting the CTC Town Hall meeting in Del Norte County, and also to thank Tamara Layton, Executive Director for the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission for organizing this event. Um, many of the issues and challenges with Del Norte County are similar across the other North State Super Region counties. So thank you for taking the time out to listen to the challenges and concerns in Del Norte County. 
Thank you. Questions? I have just one question. Sure. Last time we were all together in uh, Chico and talking about the North State Super Region, I believe, um, we were talking about the safe vehicle rule, and unfortunately that hasn't gone away. It appears to be coming our way effectively within a few weeks here. So can you give us, what are you all talking about and what are we going to do? Um, the safe vehicle rule affects uh, some of the isolated rural non-attainment areas a little bit differently. Um, the isolated rural non-attainment areas don't have to do conformity on their TIPS or their regional transportation plans, but they do have to do conformity on a project level basis. Um, we have one project in Nevada County, the State Route 49 widening. Um, we should be able to get through and complete the PAED for the project, but then before we can move to the next phase, we need to do a transportation conformity analysis. So that's going to kind of put that project in a delay position uh, while things kind of get sorted out. Um, and unfortunately, I think the state has sued uh, the federal government, but they did it on a temporary stay instead of a permanent stay. And so we'll have to wait for that whole legal process to conclude. Um, and I'm not certain of the impacts for some of our MPOs like Shasta County and Butte County Association of Governments uh, that may have to get uh, conformity on their plans. Well, I think just keeping us in the loop on that, uh, we're all doing everything we possibly can. There's lots of uncertainty around what this might look like and everybody has a different definition of what a grace period might be. But if we've learned one thing from our town halls, it's that all of our transportation issues are difficult enough in our rural agents, but when we add another uh, complexity, it, it gets even more challenging. So just appreciate the work. We love the fact that you all sit down and talk to each other uh, because most of our public, our residents of California, go between one area to the next on a regular basis. So. Thank you all. Yeah, Any thank questions? you. And it is of particular concern for, for rural agencies such as, as mine because any project delays amount to dollars. Um, and then we find ourselves chasing dollars when we're already chasing dollars. We're chasing bigger dollars. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Humboldt County Association of Governments. Good afternoon. You've, uh, th my name is Marcella Clem, the Executive Director for the Humboldt County Association of Governments. You've met Councilmember Avis from Ferndale, and with me today is Councilmember um, Johnson from Rio Dell. He is also our rep representative on the uh, Last Chance Grade Stakeholder Group, and I'll let him speak first. Thank you, Marcella. It's great to be here uh, speaking before the Commission. Uh, I would like to give you kind of a analogy from my own life experience. When comparing the average Caltrans project to the last chance grade. About 45 years ago, I got into running and it just went crazy with me. Before long, I was doing uh, marathons and beyond. And the a marathon is kind of like you're at the Caltrans's average project, whether it's a curve correction, vert vertical, horizontal, you know, addition of some riprap at the outlet of a culvert, widening for sight distance, adding a creeper lane for trucks, whatever it might be. A 26 mile race takes five, six years. Couple hours, if we're good. <laughs> when I was really young, yeah. Uh, then we get to the last chance grade. We're about five years into it, and we've pretty well defined the problem, but we're nowhere near a solution. This is like a 100-mile run. It's like taking a marathon and stacking it on another and another and another. And as a long-distance runner, you got to keep focused. And that's yours and Caltrans's job for the next bunch of years. And keep self-assessment. How am I doing here? Am I running when I should be running? Am I drinking when I should be drinking? Am I resting when I should be resting? but constantly making forward progress. Thank you. So that makes it the Leadville 100, and <laughs> all of our partners are to get in the zone 
and uh, hydrate. That's what you told us, yeah, right? Last, last, last chance grade uh, is like Western States 100. Thank you. So I, I added this slide, as I thought the meeting might be a little slow, so <laughs> this is a protest photo for, the, uh, for Richardson's Grove, um, and apparently it worked, Richardson's Grove is not moving forward, uh, and this picture does illustrate the remaining, the existing need for safety, if you can imagine two trucks trying to pass each other. Okay, did I already mess it up? Oh, there we go. Uh, I added this slide to remind myself to thank you for your leadership in the passage of Senate Bill 1, and also to thank you for uh, continuing to allow regional transportation planning agencies to program rehab projects in the state transportation improvement program. As you can see, the, we, uh, every city, uh, every county has a, a large, um, uh, many miles of pavement. In Humboldt County, it's over 1,200 paved roads, uh, the county and the cities. We have 170 local bridges. And I did add the 2018-19 um, road maintenance and repair fund amounts that each uh, jurisdiction received. Um, you know, the city of Trinidad received $7,000. You can't do much with that. Uh, and it seems like the county did really great uh, with the 4.8 million, but that was less than half of their annual uh, road budget need. So um, we're still struggling, but we're very thankful for the passage of Santa Bill 1. The following slides, I'll try to go very quickly, are projects that we uh, will be bringing forward in the future. Uh, this project has already been funded in the State Transportation Improvement Program, but only for the environmental phase. There are two uh, intersections, interchanges, that we're working with Caltrans, Caltrans is partnering with the City of Fortuna. Um, currently, the highway bisects the City of Fortuna. The tourist area is on one side next to the Eel River. The town's on the other. And there really is no safe way to get there without a vehicle. Um, the Eureka, um, probably before my time, 20 years ago, there was talk of a bypass, and that did not move forward. Uh, and I know that congestion is relative, but in my view, if you are on a road and you sit through a light twice, it's congested. And that does happen on Highway 1 <laughs> through Eureka. So um, we are currently doing a corridor plan for a portion of the highway. And what we're going to look at is somehow relieving the traffic on the highway um, onto a local road, the Waterfront Drive. So the Waterfront Drive goes along the, the coast or the, the bay, I should say, and then we're hoping that somehow it can connect up there. But we're in the very beginning of the process. We have our first public meeting next week, um, and we're hoping that we will qualify for the, uh, the Solutions for Congested Corridors program uh, in the future. Oh, I keep doing that. Um, uh, this, um, in, I wanted to take a step back. Uh, the Hitchcock Board um, deliberated and came up with these a list of priority projects uh, at the request of Representative Huffman. Um, we're hoping to get federal funds for these projects. Um, uh, the Humboldt Transit Authority is uh, on its way to being all electric vehicle fleet with one bus so far um, by 20, uh, 2040. They are starting. One funny thing, um, yesterday I met with, with the uh, general manager. He just discovered that when you turn the heat on, the range decreases by 37%. So that was news to him. You can't open the door either. Oh, I did not. I'll, I won't tell him that. <laughs> um, so the uh, Humboldt Transit Authority did receive a Caltrans planning grant. They are working on um, a uh, microgrid system. That picture is from the Blue Lake Rancheria, and they're, they are leaders in the region in terms of um, solar energy and being green. Um, McKinleyville uh, is the largest unincorporated community. It's, um, the population is um, higher than five of our seven cities. Um, and there are certainly a uh, lot of safety needs in, in this area. Um, I believe they, they have received some uh, STIP funds to do uh, one intersection that they're looking at, but it is a corridor problem. So we will be looking at HSIP. We will look at every uh, possible funding. It could be before the commission in the future. Um, this is downtown Garberville. Um, uh, environmental phase, as well as the divine phase, is funded in the STIP. 
Um, we'll, we'll be coming back for construction on that as well. Uh, the Hammond Bridge replacement this, um, is only a pedestrian and bicycle uh, facility. It um, is nearing its end of life. Um, so it's, it's going to be a very expensive project. We did, uh, the county did apply for the uh, ATP program in the very first cycle. It did not score well at all. Um, we had other priority ATP projects come through, um, but we will be revisiting that program as well. And this is, um, it will be another active transportation project in the future. The area in the red is the plan, planning study area that the city of Arcata was successful in receiving a Caltrans grant. Um, to do, uh, continue the, the uh, Bay Trail um, and hopefully get all the way to Blue Lake. You can, you can see the little green at the top. So that's the extension of the future extension of the um, Annie and Mary, Mary Trail. Once the city got started on their planning process, um, and it's something they did with the Bay Trail, they realized that it didn't make sense just to end at their city limits. So they are extending their planning study and they will, are willing to take on maintenance outside of their jurisdiction in the county. So they did that as well with the Bay Trail so that the trail ends at a, a logical place. Uh, this is uh, just a, a big rehab project uh, that the county uh, has <laughs> on their list for a while. It's just, a, a, it would take most of their budget to do this, but um, we'll see how, what, what funding we can find for that. And with that, uh, I'll end my presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are on to Del Norte County Regional Airport that we got to go into last night, but not actually fly into. Good afternoon, uh, Commission. My name is Randy Hooper. I'm the airport director of the airport that you almost had the pleasure of uh, visiting yesterday. <laughs> I apologize for that. If there is something we could have done about the fog, believe me, we would have. Um, as we posted on our Facebook page yesterday, kind of in jest, if anybody has a defogging machine, please let us know. We'd, be, we'd love to take it. <clears throat> um, so I'd love to give you a little overview on uh, activities at the, uh, at the airport. Um, it's been a pretty exciting uh, couple years for us, uh, just for your edification. The airport is owned by Dolnar County, and it's administered by an airport authority, which is the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority, which is the only uh, JPA, in my understanding, in creation that actually crosses uh, state boundaries and includes tribal governments. So it includes the city of Crescent City, Dolnar County, city of Brookings and Oregon, Curry County, uh, the Elk Valley Rancheria, the Tolowadani Nation, uh, I think I got them all there. Um, so anyway, uh, the airport is, uh, there's a lot of excitement going on, as I mentioned. Um, over the past year, we've uh, actually retained a new air carrier, um, which I guess you flew up to uh, the Medford Airport on last night out of Oakland Contour. Excellent, let's get to here. Um, the service began in the spring of 2018. Um, since that time, Contour has uh, transported around 20,000 individuals, either to or from uh, the Bay Area. So I think you heard earlier the population of Dolan County is about 28,000. Um, again, in planes and deep plane passengers being about 20,000. You know, obviously that's you know not all of uh, you know, every individual, but a pretty significant portion of the population has been using the service. And generally, what uh, we hear in terms of uh, praise of, of the uh, air, of the airline, it's pretty effusive. Um, for the first time in the history of our little airfield, uh, Contour actually provides jet service to the Bay Area. Uh, previous to the jet service that we currently have, it was a propeller aircraft, which is loud and noisy and typically a smaller aircraft. So the jet service seems to be something that's uh, working very well, um, despite uh, the relatively short uh, runways that we have at the Crescent City Airport. Uh, there was some speculation as to whether it could even accommodate jet service. Uh, they fly what's called an ERJ, Embraer uh, 135 aircraft. It's a 30 passenger aircraft, and it seems to do just fine on our 5,000 foot runways. Um, <clears throat> load factors have been holding pretty steady. Uh, they're about 80%, uh, meaning that we have about 25 passengers on each plane to and from uh, Oakland. Um, I, th I think that's exceeded uh, the expectations of the airline. So again, that's, that's a good thing. Um, 
the only real challenge is, as you saw yesterday with uh, our coastal community, is is going to be the fog. And again, nothing we can we can really do about that. You have those issues at San Francisco. You have it elsewhere. Uh, thankfully, the service that we have into Oakland on the east side of the bay, they don't typically have uh, the issues that they do like at San Francisco. But again, nothing we can do about it here in, in Crescent City. The air, the air field is liter literally uh, hundreds of feet away from the ocean. So it's we're, we're impacted by fog. Um, I think, you know, again, as you saw last night, one of the, the good concessions that the airline is, has kind of stepped up to is even whenever they have the issues getting into Crescent City, they've actually stepped up to the plate to provide uh, bus transportation from Medford to Crescent City. They're doing that on their own dime. They're very motivated to complete each uh, leg of the flight. Uh, they operate, and, and we have an agreement uh, through the U.S. Department of Transportation under the Alternative Essential Air Services Program, where if they don't complete a leg, they don't get paid. So they do everything that they that they can uh, to make it in. But of course, safety being the, the paramount concern, if they can get in, they can get in. Um, as I mentioned, we do uh, receive a subsidy from the Department of Transportation, the, the Federal Department of Transportation. Crescent City is uh, one of, I guess, probably a handful would be the best way to characterize it of, of uh, communities across the country that prior to deregulation in the 70s actually did have commercial service. And then whenever the deregulation happened in the 70s, there was a significant threat of the loss of commercial service for these largely rural communities. And so since that time, we've operated with that EAS subsidy. Uh, currently, we operate with an alternative EAS uh, grant through the DOT. That gives us a little more flexibility when we choose uh, the airline that we have served the community. And again, the reception from Contours has been has been pretty good. Um, we are up on the EAS grant um, next fall, September 30th, 2020. My calendar is marked. Um, we've had preliminary conversations with the DOT. Uh, things are looking good, moving into the next uh, round of funding for that uh, service, meaning that we're likely uh, going to be keeping our commercial service here in uh, Crescent City, which we're very pleased with. Um, in terms of um, exciting things, as I alluded to at the beginning of uh, my, my, my talk, uh, of things happening at the airfield, you did see the new terminal. Uh, that's huge for this community that was largely funded uh, through the FAA's uh, Airport Improvement Program, AIP program. Um, the AIP program, due to our airport classification, is 95% federal, 5% local. In this case, there were some expenses that were, were considered to be eligible as part of that. So the ratio isn't exactly 95 to 5. But anytime we have the opportunity to leverage uh, those funds, we try to take advantage of that. There's significant improvement uh, that we are uh, tapping into the AIP program to conduct in terms of airfield maintenance, um, improvements to the navigational aids, the airfield lighting system, the pavement conditions, similar to the way you folks deal with probably more uh, typically with roads. Uh, we have those same issues uh, at our airports. Um, so, uh, you know, I was invited to present uh, what's been happening at the, at the Crescent City Airport to you folks. I know you typically deal more with uh, streets and roads. I think there was some funding that was provided a couple, year, a couple years ago through the Transportation Commission for an airport land use compatibility plan under the A&D grant program. So thank you for that. Uh, that's, that's huge. Also, I think Dolnar County was maybe one of the only communities in the state that didn't have an ALUCP. Uh, so getting the funding assistance to actually get that uh, completed was a, was a big thing for us too. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Again, sorry, there's nothing I can do about the fog. Um, if you have a defogging machine, let us know. We'll, we'll take it. I have just one question sure. and one comment. Um, the contour was great and our contour. And also um, the bus was right there. It wasn't sitting on the tarmac for a long time. So... Uh, appreciate that but what happens to the traveler I mean we were fortunate we happened to have the mayor who knew to make some phone calls but what happens to the passenger that comes in and does get effectively transported but now the airport's closed how did they are they kind of on their own or we make sure that the taxis know what how do what do we do <clears throat> so the circumstances you're describing, just to be clear, are rare. Um, there's industry data that actually suggests that Contour is actually the highest performing airline in North America when it comes to uh, scheduled arrivals on time. I think in the month of September, they were 92%. It's been asked whether that data included Crescent City because of the fog, <laughs> but that is uh, industry data. To answer your question, um, there is uh, transportation from the airport to, uh, into town. I mean, if somebody were to need to, to, 
at all hours as I understand it. Um, we have digital displays in, in the terminal, so if somebody were stuck on the outside of the terminal, uh, they could look in and they could actually see uh, the cab company that has an ad running on our displays, their phone number, their, their website, their Facebook, all the pertinent details. The, the bus was great, the driver, we had a smooth ride and everything, but there might be a way, I don't know, just, you know, I mean, we had a woman with a small child and she somehow managed to figure out where, how she was gonna get where she was gonna going and, and so just, just, I mean, think about that, make sure we get that last mile for all those folks and hopefully it Absolutely. won't happen too often. I appreciate that, thank you. Thanks. Alrighty, any other questions? We're good. Okay, now we're going to move on to um, the Yurok tribe. All right. Um, hello, my name is Grant Klopmeyer, and I'm a planner at the Transportation Department. I am filling in for Brandy Natt, the Transportation Manager. She had a death in the family, so she's unable to attend today. Um, so this is just a map outlaying our reservation. Um, we span between two counties, Del Norte and Humboldt County, from the mouth of the Klamath River all the way to the confluence of the Trinity. A mile on each side is our reservation. Um, The upper and lower reservation is separated by a 20 mile gap on Highway 169. There's three miles in Del Norte County and it picks back up 20 miles down the river at uh, the village of Watek. Um, it is the only highway in the state of California with one lane. Um, many of the isolated communities uh, have uh, lack access to transportation, phones, power, and basic services. And so what we try to do is um, provide a dial ride service and medical transportation. And our other option is the York River Ferry. It uh, travels from Klamath all the way to the village of Shragon, 20 miles, 23 miles up river. Um, it also gives options uh, for those communities to uh, come together for meetings and uh, so sorry it, it cuts the travel time in half um, it takes about 40 minutes to go the 23 miles which would take actually two hours or longer going all the way around highway 169 to 101 uh, through bald hills road um, which brings me to this slide, Bald Hills Road. This is uh, the past, present, future projects we have done. It is a top priority for the Iraq tribe. In the last decade or so, we have done a few sections with the help of our partners, Humboldt County. It's a county road and uh, it's surrounded by Redwood and National State Park land. Um, there's three miles that still remains unpaved and that is our top priority to work and collaborate with them to get this uh, fully paved and safe and uh, provide transportation from our upper and lower uh, reservation. It is our main uh, connection. And so here's uh, another project that we've collaborated with National and State Parks. They uh, funded us to restore our um, ceremonial brush dance site which is located on national park land. And with their help, we were able to have a uh, Yurok tribal elder mentor and uh, teach traditional practices for um, our Yurok tribal uh, trail crew, which consisted of youth and young adults. And it gave them experience to uh, you know, uh, make a cultural brush dance site. So, and then um, another, project uh, is our Klamath Gateway project. It was uh, tribally funded and with the collaboration with Del Norte County, it improved safety measures. Um, it um, gave visual aids of solar lights, uh, striping, crosswalks. It is our main strip in Klamath. Uh, 
it, uh, it, uh, or you're, I'm sorry. Um, uh, this is my colleague. Hi, Sorry. Josh Norris. Hi, Josh Norris. Um, I work with Yurok Economic Development Corporation uh, as the visitor center manager and um, also managing the, uh, a new program, which is the R Redwood uh, Dugout Canoe Tour Program. Um, I used to work in the planning department with Grant, and uh, we actually received some funding based on our trails and master waterway or <laughs> master trails and waterway program and what we're doing is uh we're it's a combination of economic development environmental concerns and bringing back uh, uh some of our cultural practices um we're we're um starting a tourism program where we are uh providing cultural heritage tours with dugout canoes which is our main source of transportation other than trails. And in the future, we hope to open up some of our more traditional trails and provide access to folks to some of our traditional resources um, uh, along the waterway. So um, our tribe was a, it was a village system. Um, we had 40 or 50 villages along the river and along the coast, and it was all connected by trails and these waterways and canoes. And so um, we received a, a sustainable community grant from Caltrans, and um, this canoe adventure program and the, and the trails is a part of this uh, of this plan to um, get cars off the road, get people to slow down as they're coming through Klamath by creating some attractions, and uh, provide some access to our families to uh, non-vehicular activities, which they currently don't have because we're. The town of Klamath is hemmed in between this hillside and 101. After the 64 flood uh, washed out the town side by the, so we, we have this barrier now and uh, nowhere for people to really recreate locally. So we're attempting to resolve all these problems with one sort of master plan. Do you have any questions for us? On that? Commissioner Van Kynenberg. Well, I applaud you for, I, I really do think uh, having, uh, uh, attracting tourism and um, uh, it serves several purposes. And so I applaud you for that. The Yuki tribe, the, are their descendants now part, do they participate in the Yurok or do, have they pretty much vanished altogether? Uh, the Yuki is not from this area. We, yeah, they were uh, on the other side of the Klamath, up, up in the hills. Oh, uh, no, they're, we're not, we're, we're not different part of cultures, okay. yeah. All right. So I have a question for y'all. So um, your population, 10,000, I was told, is that the right kind of number? Or how, Europe how? tribe? Yeah, uh, we're Europe about 6,700. 6,700, 6, yeah. okay. And are they clustered? Can you go back to the map? Forgive us, but the street time. names and the road names were not. So would they be clustered primarily in Klamath or evenly distributed or? Uh, um, most, oh, you want me to do that? Primarily in Klamath. Okay. Um, the village of Witchpeck is our second largest. And okay. We have offices up there. Okay. And then for those of us that aren't intimately familiar, where's the gap? Can you help us better understand? Um, so the gap occurs going down here? Right there where Klamath is, where it's uh, written. Okay. It picks back up at that second dot, uh, Watek. Okay. In between there. Uh, so between Klamath and Watek? Yes. No road. No road. It, okay. It um, it wasn't sustainable. It kept washing, falling apart. So they abandoned it, and the only way is to either go to Oric there, and cross over Bald Hills Road, or go all the way down past Trinidad to Arcata, go 299, and around all the way through Hoopon 96 to back to 169. And Sounds like you all have the same six-hour detour yeah. that beams a common thread here so wow any other questions director branson no okay well we heard earlier that you all are at the table with us as we try to figure out our future going forward and getting the last chance so appreciate you all helping us figure out what best to do and all of those groups we really uh look forward to getting it done
Yes, Director Branson. I actually, yes, I do have a question. Um, th several years ago, and it wasn't your, your tribe, um, you know, there was an active transportation uh, funding uh, grant, and I see that you received money through Caltrans. Do you have any problems contracting directly with Caltrans on, a, on an agreement anymore? Or, I mean, in the past, I, there was an issue, and I know that, um, is it the Bureau of Indian Affairs was the conduit, conduit yeah. between you, got, you know, the tribes and the state uh, Caltrans? Is that still how you That's do that? That's our plan to go into a tri-party agreement. Is that and, what you do? Okay. Um, the word, we're, yeah, we're working on that agreement right now. Okay. And the word is that it's getting smoother. I'm hoping so. so and that yeah. was what I, you know. <laughs> There's the economic the six month process coming is now, out. I think a three-month process. Okay, because that was as yeah. commission staff, we yeah. felt that that um, shouldn't be as a hurdle for you, you know, you all. Yeah. So that was something that we've been concerned with and had not been hearing much. So assuming that it's working through. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay, the Del Norte Trail Alliance. Ooh. Hello, my name is Joe Gillespie. Um, I'm founder and president of the Del Norte Trail Alliance. And I would also like to welcome you to Del Norte County. It's uh, such a wonderful place. And I want to emphasize um, the work of our city and county people and how hard they're working with limited staff to bring all these projects forward. Uh, they're really uh, quite amazing, I'm finding, the more I work with them. Um, I'm a retired school teacher. I taught middle school. And one of the things I saw in middle school is how, uh, over time, how inactive the kids were, especially on weekends when, uh, you know, they should be out doing things outdoors. So um, in my retirement, one of the things I've done is started this trail alliance uh, with one of our goals was to build a bike park in Crescent City somewhere. And uh, so happens the beachfront park was going through its master planning process and Prop 68 is there to provide some funding. And now the city is behind our proposal um, for a bike park at our beachfront park. Um, very excited about this. Uh, the picture that you see is uh, an example of a pump track, uh, which would be part of a, a bike park. The bike park would include, you know, some other uh, features like ramps and uh, just little boardwalks and catwalks for little kids on strider bikes and so on uh, to challenge them to develop their balance and so on. It would be a place for families to get out and ride their bikes for kids to uh, develop their riding skills. Um, and what I hope to be a focal point for this form of outdoor recreation, the bicycle, um, wherein we can provide activities for um, people of all age levels, kids of all age levels, <laughs> um, I like to say, where uh, we can start there, uh, ride out for a sunset ride out Pebble Beach Drive, um, out to Point St. George, uh, uh, where with the help of uh, Tamara and our local transportation authority, we can develop safe passage from anywhere in our community down to the bike park, um, where kids can ride from all through Beachfront Park, but also with the new um, trail over to the harbor, ride safely over to the harbor to go fishing, to access South Beach, um, and so on. So um, I see this as something really important to our community that I'm very excited about, and uh, it's just really nice to see the uh, city getting behind it. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is uh, attempting to build mountain bike trails on our, you know, 80% of our county that's public land. I've been working with the Forest Service. Uh, we submitted a proposal to the regional office this year uh, for 10.7 miles of bike trail up Hurdy Gurdy Creek, uh, where there is a campground and other uh, trails and um, facilities. Um, we were not funded, and just want to point out how difficult it is way up here in Little Del Norte with Tahoe and 
places in San, Southern California, uh, even the Mount Shasta area now, um, competing for limited funding. And um, I just often think it's easy to turn away from this community that's so far north. Um, so, and not to mention the fact that these agencies, like the Forest Service, the Forest Service nationwide has a $5 billion budget. $5 billion. And our government throws around billions uh, like it's candy. And, you know, I, I know you can't do much about that. But um, I'm just letting you know that uh, these agencies are state parks where I was just talking to uh, some of our rangers about uh, getting a, uh, a, a, an agreement so that we can go out and help maintain some of their trails because that's the third thing that we do is we're doing trail maintenance with volunteers. And um, they, they're going to have trouble, you know, finding someone to get out there with us. <laughs> they will, but uh, with limited funding. Um, anyway, that's all I had to share, just something really exciting that's happening with bicycle transportation, getting uh, our uh, local people out there doing healthy recreation with a form of transportation. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Van Kettle. Well, I would just applaud what you're doing because I, I've heard, I don't know how cohesive, but I've heard a, a, a vision of Del Norte County as a, as a recreational uh, opportunity yes. for, for both Oregon and California tourism and, and international tourism. Let's, let's be honest, people right. come from all over the world to see the resources that are here. And, and the notion of giving them options to, to mountain bike at one day, camp and fish another day, have an urban biking and, and experience in the harbor going out. There's lots of things, and this is all part of your asset map as a community that I think Correct. as you, you know, we've heard how you've grown from a resource-based economy to a tourism-based economy, but I, I just see that as, as your economic development engine going forward. And so what you're talking about, I, I just applaud. It takes passionate people in a community to to uh, make a community great, but I I think you're, what you're talking about is a really um, part of that asset map that is going to um, fund your future. Thank you. I uh, I agree with that. We're building our recreation infrastructure, as I as I like to say it. And uh, people are coming here to see the redwoods. They get here to Del Norte, and they can't believe where they are. They can't believe that there is there are so many different ways to recreate here. Um, and but what we're lacking is mountain bike trails. We have some trails that were not built for mountain bikes that are available to people. Uh, but uh, some of them are really difficult and uh, most people aren't gonna ride them. But anyway, yeah, the, the, the mountain bike is something people uh, travel with these days. And they're hitting communities with bike parks, pump tracks, and trails. So, yeah, thank you. I'm it? happy to report we picked up a biker today when we were on our tour <laughs> yeah. who had a flat tire and we got him to the bike repair shop. So I know we Tamara, hear you. Tamara wants to wrap this up, but uh, anything we can do funding wise, we'll take it. Thank you. Okay. Del Norte Local Transportation Commission. Tamara. Hi, I'm Tamara Layton, the Executive Director of Del Norte Local Transportation Commission. A couple of brief things. When we have formula funding, we need a floor. We talk about this a lot at Rural Counties Task Force. We talk about it sometimes at North State Super Region. Some of our cities, um, you heard from Marcella, one of our cities got $7,000, $9,000 as a share or a, a part of their formula funding. We often talk about a not to exceed amount with grants that, that are competitive grants, but when we have formula funding, we need something that is but no less than. Okay. Because when you have so little money that you really can't do anything with it, it's just not helpful at all. It's actually particularly difficult to spend. So when these opportunities come up in the future where there are formulas for funding, take a look at those little cities, those smaller counties, and say, what is the floor for this? What is the but no less than amount? So somebody can do something with the funding that they receive. 
Second is I wanted to talk very briefly about the Regional Surface Transportation Program funding, our RSTP funding. It's um, we take the STP funding and we make it state-only funding so it's easy to spend. We love that money. In the Del Norte region, what we do, and all of the partners have agreed to this, is we collect the money um, and we use it for match funding. Not exclusively, but nearly exclusively, the RSTP funding is used for match funding, bridge funding. We contributed $100,000 to the Yurok Tribe project that they just showed you, their, down, their gateway project. We've contributed money to the harbor for the trails when they just can't quite get their project to be complete, or when they need match funding like the Active Transportation Program. That's where our local agencies go to get match funding is in that RSTP pot. So we don't do a formula allocation. We don't just send it out and hope people manage it. Everybody's agreed that we need that for match and that's what we use it for. That's a little bit unique um, in rural RTPAs. Most of the rural communities use that for match fund or use it for um, a formula allocation that they have in their own community. And um, just in an effort to thank Lori Waters for all the time that she's spending in our community, this is my f favorite form of active transportation that's in the kayak anytime you want to go kayaking come see us i'm in any questions any questions no and thank you on behalf of the commission for all your hard work for making this happen because there's an awful lot of work that goes on to make a day like today happen so yeah. we truly truly do yeah. appreciate well, it i think everybody acknowledges that i'm not a party planner but <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on this skill. So again, thank you all. It's all good. We've, we've loved every minute of it. So now we're going to move on to our public comment uh, period. So I'm going to ask three folks to line up so we can be efficient here. The first one is Eileen Cooper, followed by Mary Niski, followed by Donna Thompson. If you three can come forward, please. Okay. Okay. And we're going to ask you to limit your comments to two minutes. Okay. Eileen, you're up. Two minutes, please. Hello. Hi. You have a handout before you about the very dangerous proposition of putting large STA trucks that off track on the highway 199 and 197 and all of your good intentions for safety projects here in the community are welcomed but this project of STA trucks on that highway is not welcomed by this community. Hundreds and hundreds of people have signed petitions, close to 2,000. When this community turned against this project, when they read the Smith Engineering Report, which is in the record of review, the environmental review, and some of the highlights are in this package for you. Um, Smith Engineering reviewed it, and he's a very prominent engineering forum for the Center of Biological Diversity, Friends of Del Norte, and EPIC. The pr project requires the drivers of STAA trucks and other long vehicles to select and maintain a virtually perfect line of travel through some curves to avoid crossing the center line. This is with your fixes. Ordinarily, if there were 12 foot lanes and shoulders conforming, conforming to the applicable mandatory standard, an STA driver would have four times as much leeway to either side of the perfect line. So these mandatory exemptions that Caltrans has permitted themselves are not minor. They are extreme 
and they are dangerous on a can narrow canyon road like you have seen today. Um, so I appreciate that you are first concerned with safety because the people of this community, when they were handed this design, they turned against this project. And we are not welcoming those trucks because the design will not handle them safely. And I am glad that you recognize that the main value of this area is its scenic beauty and recreational value, which will be significantly marred. Uh, I take you, I ask you, I have extra copies if you want to read the Smith Engineering Report for yourselves and some of the highlights of a very experienced um, uh, consultant um, who points out um, the fact that the induced traffic that will be incurred is actually has not been analyzed carefully at all. There was no evaluation of what would be induced from I-5. So this is a faulty plan and it's the elephant in the room that will overshadow all your safety concerns for this community if it moves forward and all of your concern for enhancing the recreational values of this community. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll take that for the record. Okay, we have Mary. Hi. Um, I'd also like to commend uh, Caltrans for commissioning the outside safety assessment of the Highway 199. Uh, but I noted he didn't say anything about the plans to allow the large STAA trucks um, on this highway. And I'm adamantly against this plan and anyone, and I understand you folks also rode that highway yesterday or last night. Um, that anyone who has ever driven on this highway should be adamantly against it as well. Short of dynamiting the canyon walls, there is no way, and destroying the river, there is no way to make this highway wide enough for these trucks to transit safely on this highway. Plain and simple. It just can't happen. The, the canyon walls are too unstable and they'd, they'd destroy our river. And if there was an accident with one of these trucks, it'll destroy our river. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Donna Thompson, and we're gonna be followed by, I think it's Dan Gillespie and Stephanie Alexander. Yes, Donna. Yes, I'm Donna Thompson, and I'm a native Californian and have lived here about 21 years now in Crescent City. Um, and I do want to say something about the SDAA trucks also. Um, yeah, we are very much in the summer, especially um, lots and lots of tourists on 199 and uh, lots of um, either towing, uh, of living, uh, whatever you call it, or uh, just driving that road. And to have STAA trucks going along at the same time as tourists would be really dangerous. And also, uh, most of those STAAs, since they're not driving on 199 now, um, the drivers don't know that road and they won't know that particular curve that cannot have the four feet clearance. It can only have one foot clearance. And that's really dangerous. Those, we have accidents with regular trucks fairly often on 199, as it is. SDAs are a bad idea. And then 197 has many residential driveways. It's a residential road. To have SDA trucks going back and forth with all these driveways is not a good idea. So. Please take note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Dan Gillespie. Yeah, thank you for being here. My name's Don Gillespie. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Don. right. I can't write for beans. I guess. And, I uh, couldn't tell if it was a Don or a Dan. And I sorry, I only have it. two minutes. I wish I could just talk with you. You guys are very inviting and engaging. 
and I appreciate that, but I'll try and honor your two minutes, so I'll read my statement. Um, and I've, I've always had a lot of respect uh, for Caltrans and for the commission, and then many examples of great uh, engineering projects throughout our state that really do um, enhance safety on our highways. And Caltrans is, a, is the, they're the safety experts that, that we know. And yet, um, when the Highway 199-197 SDAA safety, safety in quotes, I think that was added on later after the project was initially proposed. When that project came to light 10 years ago, and then during the EIR process, it became obvious that Caltrans proposed a highly ill-conceived project that creates a more dangerous highway by encouraging the use of SDAA trucks. And your own estimations are that up to 92 trucks per day, in addition to the California legals we already have, could be added to our highway in, uh, after the project is completed. Five curves to be improved that supposedly makes the highway safe for SDAA truck use, not a, not, my, not a chance. Not one of these curves is located between Gasky and Hayuchi, this, um, and which is the most used portion of the, of the highway, and that has the highest rate of accidents. Um, and yet there, this project doesn't include anything there. According to your project description for the EIR process, Caltrans plan to exempt themselves from their own mandatory safety design standards at the Narrows, for example, leaving only a one foot tolerance for the STAA truck drivers for air along the narrow winding highway, where four feet is required. A local transportation commission, even after the EIR process, just seems to blindly go along with these outrageous safety exemptions and assuming to me a, like a cheerleader mentality to our public to promote this and get the job done. People want safety improvements. I do too. But the STA trucks are not, there's no economic need for them. And, um, and they'll, it, they, with, with our, uh, our county, uh, Chamber of Commerce says that $150 million a year comes into our community f for uh, tourism. That is intended, that's going to grow over the years. And so we have four months a year where 199 is people pulling trailers, driving motorhomes, um, coming to see the sites, and then you get uh, combine more trucks with that. It's just, it's not a, a good formula. So, thank you for your time. Okay. And um, please reconsider this project for the SDA truck use this area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna um, do a little housekeeping here. I've been remiss. I'm gonna ask the future speakers to um, not only tell us their name, but tell us who they're representing. And I'm gonna read these just for the record so we have it. So Eileen Cooper representing Fins of Del Norte. I believe that's right. Mary Niski was representing herself, Donna Thompson representing herself, and Don Gillespie representing yourself. Did I get that right for the record? Everybody's cool? Okay, thank you. So going forward, I'll be more efficient. So with that, Stephanie. Hi, you guys are still smiling. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie Alexander, Alexander Family Farms. We're organic dairy farmers. And we have a couple dairies here in this county as well as Humboldt County. Um, we have 70 employees in the two counties, 150 employees, 15 employees altogether. Now on our farm, if you remember the um, Dr. Fine Bridge mm -hmm. and you look toward the ocean, our farm is that way where all the green grass is, where the life really flourishes. And um, on our farm, we have bald eagle nest. We have 350 elk. We have coho salmon going through our stream. So our family as dairy farmers we consider ourselves environmentalists and so we really care and we really want this to be a win-win situation for our community um every day consumers vote with their dollar they vote with their pocketbook and it's getting harder and harder to be a dairy farmer and it's a bloodbath in the dairy farming industry it has been for a few years 
And when we went organic, it was hard to find feed. We ended up having to buy a hay ranch, and we ended up having to buy our own trucks mm -hmm. to, do, to um, have that hay come here. We do buy hay from other um, vendors, and we also bring in organic grains, and we need to hire trucks to do that. And finding the trucks to come into our area is hard. Um, we deal with 38 trucks a week that come in and out of our area for our, our usage. We also work with Humboldt Creamery where we sell our milk. Their trucks transport our milk and Rumiano cheese and, and allied industry that are very important all with trucks. And for us, it's an economic thing. Um, we're a small community. We work together. We have friends on both sides of the fences. And like I said, we want it to be a win-win but we ask that you move fast to fix these roads. Um, 101 is a huge concern to be an island, and it would hurt our business drastically. And we just want to encourage you to keep moving in the right direction, fix our roads. Uh, we are for the widening of 199, and it would only be a five feet increase on the truck length. And today with trucks, the way they have ELDs, logs, and the drivers are more professional and more safer than ever. It's not the truck drivers that are causing the problems on the roads today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we have Adam Spencer followed by John. I think that's John. I hope I got that right. Uh, Rumiano and Victor. Victor's going to have to help me out with his last name. So we'll start with Adam. Hi, my name is Adam Spencer. I uh, have an ecotourism uh, company here uh, dealing with uh, thousands of guests that we take on river trips and bike trips. And most of these people are visiting via our highways. Uh, some people get to fly into our new beautiful terminal, but most people are flying into slightly larger airports or linking several locations throughout the Northwest or throughout California together. And so we hear about uh, how they feel about driving these windy roads. And I also live right on 199. And I think that we all could agree that the safest thing that could take place for Highway 199 is to have the safety improvements and to limit the truck size to the current California legal size. It's not like there aren't uh, California highways uh, in other places that have been able to have their safety improvements. There's California 243 and um, 70 by Palm Springs, 150 and 33 by Ventura, much higher populated areas that still are able to have California legal non-STA highways and get all the improvements needed. I understand that when this project was first going forward, using STIP money, using certain things seemed like the best way to go. But if it's possible to get these safety improvements done and to continue to keep the truck sizes at where they're at, I think it's the safest way possible and the best for a community that is trying to uh, really boost sustainable tourism. Um, it just seems to make the most sense. So I hope that people like Alexander Farms can continue to find the trucks that they're currently finding to bring people in and it can work for everybody, but if we can somehow get those improvements done without the larger trucks, it is preferable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. John? Hello there. I'm Joe B. Rumiano, fourth generation Sorry. owner of Rumiano Cheese Company, which is a hundred year old business here in Crescent City, California, right down the road here. I echo uh, Stephanie's statements about the dairy industry. It's very difficult and competitive to be in right now and has been for a long time. So we do need to get any competitive advantages that we can or just to be able to compete with some of these other states out there. I'm on phone calls often with other states that have lower costs and we know California is overregulated to the nth degree. So we have all those extra costs that we incur day to day as a business in California. So um, last chance grade, obviously a big deal. We've, uh, I've just had the opportunity to have Senator McGuire at the cheese plant last Friday, toured him around, showed him everything that we're doing, all the cool things. We currently employ about 50 people there. We also have 27 local family farms, 19 organic and eight conventional dairies in Del Norte and Humboldt County. So roughly 50% of that milk comes from Humboldt County. And that's 
over last chance grade. So if that road goes out, um, we're going to have a difficult time making cheese, um, half of it at least. So um, anyways, I would like to encourage you guys to uh, really try to move that project forward any way you can. Uh, compromise is always a good solution. Um, and, you know, I've traveled around the world, looked at different um, countries, for example. Switzerland seems to build tunnels all over the place. Um, and maybe that's a solution or in part. Um, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to share my concerns, as you've heard from pretty much everyone in this room and uh, you know encourage you guys to stop by and come by the cheese plant anytime I could be proud to show you around we drove by today but uh, so are you running your own fleet or are you contracting um, both and so okay. like I said to compromise we do we we have to order custom milk trucks so we have custom built trailers I call them the Smiths model they come from okay. Bull Boel and uh, Walker and we order them like takes it two years to get them and we, wow. we get them up here and you know the 48 foot reefer trucks like Stephanie we have to you know have special sized trucks we get the LTLs they come down up from Umpqua and then they can go over 299 if they wish or go back up so there are options it's just a longer option more cost you know people don't like to do that so you know that's any more questions no but thank you for yep. taking time thank I appreciate hearing from all of you all right, now we have Victor, and Victor, help me out with your last name here. I'm going to learn it. Bish last name is Beliance, here representing Beliance. California okay. State Parks. Thank you. Um, just want to talk about what we've been doing with Caltrans, um, county officials, uh, regulators, and others to come up with a solution for last chance grade. Um, my, my mission is to protect resources, natural and cultural and provide people opportunities to experience those um, when we look at a last chance grade i applaud what caltrans has been doing uh, we serve on natural resource group cultural resource group partners group as well as huffman's uh, stakeholder group we've had thousands of hours that have staff time that have gone into it um, we're looking at what's happening even when you look at the geotechnical uh, studies that need to be done. We're supporting that with permitting. We're supporting that with staff. Uh, we're trying to facilitate this and make it as easy as possible. Um, by doing these studies, we're able to eliminate some of this compliance portion of it because there are some of the alternatives that are removed from it. You see that with the C examples. But I applaud um, data-driven decisions. Uh, we could go two miles inland and find these same geological features that you do on the current alignment. And we don't necessarily want to impact those resources that I mandated to protect if we don't have to. So the method that's going on, the cooperation that's going on, is appreciated by state parks. I'm here to protect resources. And this project is, you know, it's meeting the goals. Impacts are never good. Um, we realize that there will be impacts what we're trying to do or reduce those impacts. So thank you for your time and thanks for coming up here. Thank Questions? you, we appreciate your help and your input. Yep. So it's all good. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, Sandra, Jerebeck, did I say your name right? Maybe close. Another one of these Eastern European names I like <laughs> Bialitz. <laughs> Sandra Jerebeck. Jerebeck, that um, close. Yes, okay. and I'm another one of those people like Joe Gillespie who spends hours every month restoring some of our state um, public lands because the agencies up here, state and federal, are just grossly underfunded and we do feel like the rest of the state has forgotten us. And uh, so volunteers that I work with are very, very much needed. And frankly, restoration wouldn't happen up here without them. Uh, so I really appreciate how far you've come and that you are paying attention to us today. And that is just fabulous. And thank you so much. I hope you got to see a little bit of this very special county. And I'm going to be passionate about it for a moment. 
Uh, it is more than 80% public land. Most of that is the National Recreation Area uh, that was put in uh, or designated to protect the Smith River. I don't know if you've been told today that the Smith River is California's last undammed river. And you can go up this river and you can see uh, pools that are blue-green, jade-colored pools that are 30 feet deep, and you can see to the bottom of these pools because of the water quality. It's incredibly high. And this is why you're hearing from people that don't want big trucks on 199 and 197 because they and we are absolutely passionate about protecting California's last undamned river that has wild fish. Um, so I realize I don't have much time left. I want to say very quickly that I want to defend the last chance grade process. People are complaining that it takes too long, but under the leadership of Congressman Huffman and State Senator Mike McGuire, it is an inclusive process that includes conservation groups, it includes parks, it includes everybody. I feel that Caltrans made a big mistake on 199 and 197 because that was an exclusive process. All these different people were not included. Um, Caltrans, I feel, unfortunately misled the county at the time, this is past history, into believing that we could not have safety improvements on 199 and 197 unless we also took the big trucks. Thank you very much for listening and being here. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, in my queue line, I have Janet Gilbert and Joe Gillespie. Hi, my name is Janet Gilbert. I want to tell you um, two stories on the 199 that happened to me. On my last trip to Medford, I was on a, uh, one of the one of tight curves where the road actually cantilevers out over the river and you just have a guardrail there. There's really no shoulder. And um, as I entered the curve, a big rig truck came around the bend the other way uh, and it was across the double yellow center line. Um, I was in a Chevy Volt. He was in a big truck. It was a very, very uh, stressful broad sunny day there was no weather events but um, it was very stressful for me and I would like you to imagine if those two vehicles involved were not a Volt but another big rig truck coming around that curve and one of them has crossed the center line or, or a school bus with children in it or um, motor homes or an RV towing a, a trailer and one of these big trucks crosses the line and this was not an STAA truck it was just an approved truck on that road. And then imagine that happening on a rain slick weather day or a weather night. And the problem is magnified. Um, I've been stuck on the 199 when a big rig took the curve wrong and fell over and just, and it tipped over. It went too fast. It tipped over. It spilled all of its cargo. The whole road was backed up as people are trying to first get an ambulance. The driver was hurt and clean up the before road could be reestablished to move traffic. Uh, the Smith River is our drinking water. Imagine if that cargo had been a hazardous cargo or um, a material that could damage the fish, which doesn't take much to damage the fish in that river or pollute it for us. So um, we rely on that river. We rely on the, the recreational industry, and we rely on that water for our lives. And we need to keep it clean and purified, and we need to minimize the risks that human error can cause. Thank you very much. Okay, and Janet, you're representing yourself, right? Okay, thank you. If I can ask all our speakers just to clarify that for our record, we need to do that. So Joe Gillespie. Yeah, um, I would like to clarify that I'm speaking for the Friends of Del Norte. Oh, you are? Um, okay. I am president of the Friends of Del Norte. And, um, you know, we have litigated on Highway 199. And um, we did that with 
great consideration over a number of years of talking about Highway 199, the need for safety improvements, and um, great fear for our local residents driving that road. People drive that road over to Medford to shop all the time. And uh, I have to tell you, our number one concern has been the safety of, of local residents and what those large trucks could bring um, safety-wise, uh, the dangers of the large trucks. Um, we're also concerned about the quality of our water, as uh, Janet mentioned. Um, not only is this the last undammed river, but it's the most pristine river in the state. And a lot of people say it's one of the most pristine in North America. And um, um, you know, you drove it, you saw it. We have this dilemma. Um, I care about our local industry and I really care about, and we all do uh, in our organization, about local industry and their ability to compete. Um, so this is a real dilemma on Highway 199, and it's one that you guys have to consider seriously if we're going to move, move forward. Um, there is 299, um, and uh, anyway, I want, to ask, I want to say one other thing. Um, I've been driving that road since I was 15 and a half. I learned to drive curves on that road. Um, I remember a day when there weren't so many accidents on that road. And with safety improvements that we've had, we're having more accidents. And it's because people are driving too fast. And cars go too fast. And as uh, someone pointed out, even as you let off on the accelerator, the car goes too fast. Now, I heard the safety inspector or person suggesting that he's put up chevrons and flashing lights. And yet, people still drive t so fast that uh, even on curves that are not that dangerous, it would seem people are going into the river. I think the answer is people are going too fast and others are following too close. Now, I really do believe that there needs to be some kind of a campaign, uh, at least for this highway, where we inform people that they need to slow down. They need to leave sooner to get there. This is local residents, too. And I know how we Americans are. We want to be efficient. We want to uh, get there in the most efficient way. Our car goes fast. My big truck uh, can go faster than your little car. Um, and this plays out all the time as we drive Highway 199. You can see it. You can see people pressured to go too fast by people behind them. And uh, I believe that's what's causing the accidents until we all slow down. And I don't know if Caltrans can do anything about that. If there are, is a statewide advertising program, you know, to go out into our media that says, hey, people, slow down and enjoy the drive. Uh, we need to do that on Highway 199. Would be happy to talk to any of you after this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Steve Meitz. Or meets? Mets. Mets. Okay, I'm striking out here today. It's impossible to get it right. That's a <laughs> trick question. Hi. Well, thanks so much for coming up. My name is Steve Metz. I'm the superintendent of Redwood National and State Parks. And uh, you heard from my uh, counterpart from uh, State Parks, Victor, earlier. And I'm just here today to uh, lend our support for all the great efforts that Jamie and his team is doing on Last Chance Grade. Um, national and state park staff are fully engaged in this process in all four stakeholder groups and we are while we are here of course as parks to protect the resource and but we also are here also to provide visitor access and so this is a great way for visitors to access without the highway they can't access these great redwoods and experience them and so we're, we're part of this and both protecting resources but we're also very supportive of the overall project as well and getting it done for our visitors our multiple million dollar visitors and all the economic impact they bring to the area. So again, just wanted to bring my support and say uh, we got a great team here uh, at Caltrans and we're very happy to work with them and look forward to working with them in the future. Hey, well, that's great. Any questions? I have my senior pass. I'm good. Oh. Last time. <laughs> that's impossible. <laughs> Anybody doesn't have one, you got to get one of those great passes. 62, is that how old you have to be? Yeah, okay. Don't miss out. But don't lose it, because I lost mine, and then I had to do another one. Yeah. All right, do we have any other comments from the public? 
Okay, well, on behalf of the commission and all of our team here and everybody who put this together, uh, we can't thank you enough. It's one of the best things we do at the commission, I think, is really get out and see and hear and connect with everybody. So um, thank you all very much for sharing your insight and your passion and thank you for your hard work because it's pretty evidence to us that all of you know each other well and and are working together and sitting around the table to figure this all out and uh, let's get last chance so that we can throw that name away and give that project a new name and it will be uh, what smooth ride or something let's give it a creative name and uh, not have a last chance anymore. So with that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting.